Hi, I'm Matt Reeves, uh, writer, director, producer of The Batman. Um, the beginning of the film is an interesting thing because I was thinking about these, the way these movies normally begin, and they usually begin with something very, very propulsive and kinetic, an action scene usually, and I wanted this to be very point of view driven, very intimate, and in that way almost a sort of have a perverse difference from the way that one of these movies might traditionally begin. And as we were cutting the scene, um, I had wanted, always part of the script, the Ave Maria piece of music was a key part of Riddler's character, that when he was a child, he would have been in the choir and singing at the orphanage. And so as we were looking at this scene, it was originally in the first cut that Bill put together of it, Bill, our editor, Bill Hoy, he had used uh, some music that was um, some suspense music, some stuff drawn from Michael's stuff. And we were looking at it, and I just was like, what if we tried the Ave Maria? And there was something about the juxtaposition uh, of that with this sort of tone of voyeurism. There's a sense of uh, sort of menace as you're watching and hearing this guy breathe and watching this child here as you're hearing that music and the kind of incongruity of it um, just really seemed to, to give something to the opening. And it's interesting because when I was writing, I started writing this script back in 2017. And my son was very young, and for Halloween that year, he was a, a red ninja. So that found its way into this story here. Um, and doing this shot here, like, you know, working with Greg Frazier, our director of photography, this building is actually only two stories tall. And so we added a CG level with Dan Lemon, our VFX uh, supervisor who worked with me on the Apes films. And then we had to find a way to create the idea that the camera was truly that point of view and was handheld and we're supposed to be looking through the binoculars. And uh, so we bought a, we got a special rig that we set up um, that was actually a crane that was powered by our camera operator had a device he was down on the ground and he was holding it as if it was, uh, as if it was um, a uh, handheld device, but it wasn't. It would mimic his movement, even with the camera way up high. And then what was inside the window was actually shot on the stage. So what you're seeing there in that opening shot is really three different locations sort of put together. Now, what I wanted to do was start in this point of view that you're going to see multiple sort of voyeuristic points of view. Later, you see the drifter and Batman doing the same thing, and the movie's meant to have this sort of comment about the point of view and, and comparing their points of view so that as the movie starts and says the Batman, does that mean this point of view is the Batman? And then the idea was to then go into the scene and for you to get lulled. And then we had Paul Dano in his Riddler outfit waiting behind Rupert who plays uh, Mayor Mitchell. And I have to say working with Paul um, was a very special experience. He's a really uh, creative and thoughtful and meticulous person. And as you can see here, I don't know if you can quite tell, he has um, cling wrap around his head because he was convinced that the Riddler was so meticulous that he wouldn't want any fibers of his hair or anything. So it meant he had to wrap his head in cling wrap and he tried it and I thought he looked terrifying. So he did it and I would say after about three takes on this, he took off his mask just to take a break and he was beet red. And I said, are you, are you okay? Are you sure you want to commit to this? He goes, no, no, I, I told you I would have cling wrap on my head. And so here it is, you can see the cling wrap right here. But it was quite a commitment that he made. And what I love about working with Paul is I love to do a lot of takes. So we shoot a lot of takes. And then he wants to shoot just as many as I do. So after I've done like 40, he might be like, oh, I I've got another idea, can we try this? And in this scene, when he came up, this was something I wrote into the script. This was right from the beginning, this idea that you see him out of focus in the background and that tool that he is attacking the mayor with comes flying into frame and then he comes and picks it up. In one of the takes, after I'd say we'd done probably like 10 or 15, Paul said to me, I think I'm so tired from that. I wanna go sit in the corner. So there was this amazingly chilling take that was just, again, it was too long, the beginning of the movie. This isn't a short film. So I didn't end up using it, but it was an amazing thing that was very emblematic of the kind of work that Paul would do that I just loved, which is he would try many different things and we, they all paid off. And 
here we're making this transition. So you start with the Riddler, you start in this point of view, and then suddenly you make this shift. And I wanted to, when I was first sitting down to write, I was thinking about the challenge of the practicality of being Batman. The idea of how does he look for crime? And it, when you think about it, being Batman from a practical sense makes no sense whatsoever. If you're walking in the middle of Gotham Square, you're passing like a 7-Eleven and you're wearing a bat suit, it's, you, you really stand out like a sore thumb. So I thought, well, it'd be fun here, first of all, to start on a night when people are wearing masks and where it's, you know, so we start on Halloween and that was really honestly inspired by the long Halloween. And when I was looking at um, year one, the Frank Miller, uh, David Mazzuccelli classic, there's a moment before Bruce becomes Batman where he takes on a third persona because obviously Bruce Wayne is very famous as well. And he is walking in the East End. It's actually where he eventually meets for the first time Selina Kyle. And he's dressed as a drifter. And so this outfit that Rob has in this scene is inspired by year one. And um, it's funny because in the, in the commemorative edition of the comic, you see that Frank Miller's notes to Mazzuccelli were that in this scene, Bruce Wayne looks like he just won the Travis Bickle lookalike contest. And so this whole idea of being in this journal that, uh, that Bruce is sort of reading to us right now, we don't realize it until we get back to the Batcave and we realize he's been writing all of this down. But I wanted him to have this almost Travis Bickle-like quality of keeping a journal. And it was really inspired a little bit by Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the idea of Dr. Jekyll sort of charting the way the book does, charting his experiment, sort of seeing what the effect of becoming Mr. Hyde is on him and what happens to him and then keeping track of it and writing it down. And so all of the stuff here, I thought, okay, we have a year two Batman. There's, this isn't an origin tale. We're gonna start right inside of his head and how do we do that? Let's start in his journal and the journal will be a, a recording of the nights when he goes out into the city. And I actually, when I was writing, also found a journal online from a rookie cop the first year of his career. And he was talking about going out, you know, that he worked the night shift, and he talked about becoming a nocturnal animal because he was coming out at night. And I just thought that was so great, and I thought it so spoke to this idea of Bruce going out and in a way, in, in talking to Rob, this was very much our discussion, he's sort of addicted to this activity. This event that we don't see in the movie, it's not an origin tale, but we refer to it later, that when his parents are killed, he never has really gotten over that. And so being Batman is really him just trying to make meaning of his life. And so while it sounds very heroic in a certain way, it's actually personally driven. It's really about him sort of being driven to make sense of, him, of his life, of what happened to him, and the only way he can know how, which is to try and sort of channel all of his energy into vengeance and to sort of play that out against the criminal ele element in uh, the city. And as he's tracking this, he, he really doesn't understand why after a year or two of doing this, it doesn't seem to be lessening crime in the city. And that is the beginning of this arc that I wanted to make this character go through. For me, what was really important because we'd seen so many great Batman movies was to not do an origin tale, but to do a story where we have an arc of Batman, not one of the rogues gallery characters after he becomes Batman, but Batman in his early days at a point where he hasn't yet learned fully how to be Batman. And that was, I think, important to me because I felt like if we could tell a story um, that really goes back kind of to the noir elements of like Bob Kane and Bill Finger, those no noir sort of detective story, world's greatest detective story uh, elements that we could take Batman and have him on this case and have the case sort of unnerve him because this killer is leaving messages to him. And that as that plays out, eventually the mystery will double back around and start to talk about his past and become very personal and it will rock him to his core. And then by the end, he could have this arc where Batman 
himself, not Bruce becoming Batman, but Batman has, to, has an awakening and has to change. This moment here, uh, Greg Frazier and I talked about for a long time and did a lot of testing on, which was this idea that that bat suit was designed to, to function so that the one practical thing about it is it's supposed to be intimidating. And so I thought this idea of him literally materializing out of the shadows, what that would look like. And we worked on this idea of having him merge from the shadows. And then what I talked to Rob Alonzo, who is our, our great um, uh, uh, stunt supervisor and he did second unit um, on the film, was I said to him, I wanted that moment where he says, I'm vengeance. And Rob comes out and you see him as this Batman for the first time. I wanted it to be like that moment, a shocking moment in Goodfellas when Henry Hill, uh, the neighbor has uh, sort of assaulted Karen, who he's dating, and he, he gets so angry, you see him drive up across the street from the neighbor, he gets out of the car, they look at him coming, and he takes out his revolver, and he beats this guy senselessly, and it's shocking, and at that moment, you realize the depth of his rage and just how dangerous he can be. And so I wanted Batman, at this stage of the movie, to kind of shock the audience and for people to say like, oh, okay, well, what kind of Batman is this? And to see that he was a Batman who acted from this very visceral, personal point of view, that this was all about vengeance. And this, this uh, actor here, Jay, who I think is lovely, he, I just love, there's a tiny little smile that he does there because there's this part of him, he doesn't want to do any of this and he's in awe of Batman, but he's scared. And then I think what was key to me here was that Aki, who plays the person who Batman essentially has just saved, he doesn't thank him. He essentially says, please don't hurt me because this is the message of this Batman. It's the early days and people don't necessarily know that he is out for good. In fact, he's projecting into the city this sense of being a violent vigilante, taking the law into his own hands. And he, he says this, the, the, the myth about him that we'd be building out there was that he announces himself as vengeance. That's how he's, he's not, it's not like the Keaton... Batman where he says, I'm Batman, he comes out and says he's vengeance. And um, that was important to me because again, this the key was to try and create a new iteration. And in this scene right here, this was a really hard part of it too. Because if we one was what how does Batman find crime? Then when he addresses the crime, what does he do? He acts in this very sort of violent, personal, rage-filled way. And then this idea on the detective side was, well, how would Batman enter a detective scene? And obviously there's a lot of different versions of the movies where if there is a kind of crime scene he can kind of either appear and disappear here I wanted Gordon to take him in and to have all of the Gotham cops look at him like a freak like what is this guy doing here so that you knew that the only bond that Batman had on the police force was just his early relationship with Gordon and that the relationship between uh, you know Rob's relationship with Jeffrey was going to be one of the core aspects of this movie and that you would see um, you know like as the forensic detective does here the reactions to the crazy idea that you would bring this masked caped vigilante into a crime scene especially one as prominent here which is the mayor of the city and when Rob and I were talking about this scene because it was a hard this was actually the first scene we shot and it's a very hard thing to figure out how do you do something where I was trying to ground it make it very practical so how do you do a crime scene with a guy who's dressed in this suit. I always love this moment and that uh, when he stops and he's just, it's like he's too, he's like this wall, he can't pass the wall. And I think the thing that Rob said that I loved was, well, he so doesn't want to be seen that he has to block out that everyone is staring at him. And so he said, you know, maybe he comes into this scene like a shaman and he's, he's blocking out through the mask this idea of him and his shadow side that he... He's, bearing, he's in this very instinctual state. And so he is, he's very attuned and he's picking up on clues. He can see the ecchymosis. So that was all in the script, but the way that Rob's doing it, he was almost like an apparition. So in the scene, the way he moves, he's almost like a ghost. There's part of him that's, that's like not, he's trying to be transparent in the scene as if you can't see him, as if he's just a presence. And I loved the way he did that, but it took a while to figure out what that should be like, and even the tenor of his voice, how high his voice should be. I knew I didn't want to do a Batman that had been done previously where he had the growl that we'd seen. I felt, okay, how do we, how do we, because I knew that in this version, there's so many long, if you're going to do a detective story, 
Batman is going to have a lot of dialogue scenes, which when you actually look at all the movies, he there might Bruce might have a lot of long dialogue scenes, but Batman's dialogue scenes, he has dialogue, but it's very it's controlled. And this by literally the necessity of solving this kind of crime um, was going to require him to to have to have long dialogue scenes in that suit, which meant that if he was growling, they also, some of them were very emotional. If he was growling, we wouldn't be able to connect to him emotionally. So there was a real exploration of being out to figure out how to make that work. The cards here were super important too, because one of the early things, again, one of my approaches was I wanted to find a way to take this kind of fantastical world of Batman and make it relate to our world. So I started thinking about, um, again, inspired by the long Halloween, um, I started thinking about serial killer stories and in that I believe it's Calendar Man who is leaving um, these sort of puzzles and, and these clues behind at these crimes. And I started thinking, well, maybe there is a killer who leaves the, this correspondence and these ciphers at all of the crime scenes um, and he leaves them addressed to the Batman. And there was something in that that immediately made, made me think of the Riddler um, because of the puzzles. And then on the flip side, in terms of the real world, I thought of the Zodiac Killer. And I did a lot of reading. I, did, uh, I read um, the book Mindhunter, which is about profiling serial killers. And I just wanted to get into that mindset so I could understand this idea of what the world's greatest detective, how he would be approaching these scenes. Because I think Bruce would be doing that too. Bruce would be learning about profiling. He would be, he would doing, be doing all that kind of stuff to basically make himself a detective. And there was something about the Zodiac I think that really applied to a new version of this. And then w I worked with Paul and with Jacqueline Duran uh, to come up with exactly what that costume should look like. And actually all of the elements of the Riddler's costume are elements that you could buy somewhere. You know, you can get the, you could buy the cling wrap at a store. That was, that was um, Paul's idea. But the mask is actually a, um, you can buy it at an army surplus store. It's a winter combat mask. And, um, that along with the kind of, that is sort of almost like a Travis Bickle sort of green coat that he had. And all of them happened to be this kind of olive green. And I thought, oh, that's an interesting variation on the Riddler's classic sort of green color. And then the idea of him coming up with his own sort of question mark insignia that to me is sort of inspired by the way the Zodiac, apparently, if you see these police drawings, has uh, created his own sort of um, uh, crosshairs emblem on his chest. He was sort of making himself into a crude, horrifying, uh, almost like a superhero outfit or like an anti-hero outfit, um, a rogues gallery character. And of course it's horrifying because he was doing it for real and there was something about how that spoke about human nature that I thought, well, that would be interesting to explore because it's so unsettling to think about the power of masks that not only does Batman put on this mask and it gives him this sort of individuation, but it does it for the Riddler as well, and I wanted to constantly compare those two characters throughout the film. The other thing in terms of getting into the tone of the movie, this song was something that I listened to when I was writing the Nirvana song, and it, it was something to me that spoke about how we could do a new iteration of Bruce Wayne. We'd seen sort of the Playboy version who drives a Maserati and, you know, has many women on his arm and has seems like, you know, is portraying himself as if he, he's this kind of sexist rich kid. And that had been done. And I just thought, well, there's another reaction that someone who's been through what Bruce has been through could have, which is I kind of thought of him as like a member of the Kennedy family or, or even like, you know, a member of the British Royals. And, and the idea of that in the wake of this very high profile and tragic killing of his parents, that he could have another reaction, which was to sort of withdraw, to become kind of recluse. And that, um, you know, I thought of the idea of like Kurt Cobain sort of jamming in an old decaying manner with his sort of amps and his electric guitar. And that quality of him being almost like a rock star who was sort of a recluse. There's something in that tone that I thought, well, I think people could look at Bruce Wayne who's decided he doesn't care about being a Wayne anymore. He doesn't yet understand how useful it can even be to be a Wayne. He's addicted. The drug he's addicted to is being Batman. And he's driven to be Batman because it's the only way to make sense of his life. And here's that journal where it's year two 
and he is the Gotham Project. He notes some uh, observations, that's like that sort of Jekyll and Hyde journal. And I just thought that there was a, a different tone here where if you did see Bruce, it was a rare sighting. He, it was almost like seeing Howard Hughes or something. And if you saw him, he probably, because he only goes out at night, would look like some kind of a drug addict. And um, the reason he was is because he only went out at night and he was addicted to being Batman. And so all of those things would make the world look at him as this kind of sort of tragic celebrity somebody who's one of the Waynes but clearly was damaged and never got over it and they're probably assuming that he is heavy into drugs um, and that's his cover. They have no idea that he's actually Batman. But the idea in this Bat Cave, so this is actually James Chinlin and I talked about this when I was writing, he was talking to me about the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York and how it is rumored to have um, a secret train line and the idea that the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts might have had their own secret train lines, and we thought, okay, so instead of doing a, a classic sort of Wayne Manor that is in some sort of more away from the city um, place, that we would take Wayne Tower, which is traditionally uh, Wayne Enterprises in the business hub, and instead turn that into the home so that he would live in a tower that looked like it might be some, almost like a New York City Vanderbilt, you know, old beautiful gothic tower and then under it would be the infrastructure um, under the building for an old train line that was a private train line you actually see when he drives in there's actually an old train car there that's one of the Wayne train cars and that Bruce has essentially turned this into his garage and there's no Lucius Fox yet he doesn't have people helping him uh, to to build these projects he's kind of like I said he's like a, he's like a tinkering Kurt Cobain you know instead of uh, sort of his guitars and amps and drums set up in the living room, he is building a car from kit car parts, and he is uh, working on his bat suit, and you can see all the seams of it. So the idea was everything had to have a kind of hand-hewn quality. You can actually see the stitching in the cowl. You can see the scrapes from going out night after night. Um, and that was one of the things that was important to me was to say okay he's not at the stage yet where he lets anyone help him help him he's doing this by himself and one of the other key things was that the relationship that you have here between him and alfred was going to be different in that alfred was never really suited to be a father he he was there to protect his former mi6 he was there to protect the waynes he was close to thomas wayne and he was the one who became Bruce's guardian, but he wasn't emotionally equipped to be a father. He wasn't anywhere near being a father. And so all he could really do was teach Bruce how to fight and in a way probably helped him to avoid his emotions. And now he's starting to see, two years into this project, that this might be dangerous to Bruce and it's heartbreaking to him. And, and this glimpse here, you know, this idea of the contact lenses being one more sort of way that he takes everything in his journaling and then has to force himself to remember when he sees the way that child looks at the way the mayor's son looks at Bruce, he realizes he sees the look of, of Bruce as a child all over again, and he feels this tremendous guilt, like, how have I failed? And yet everything all comes back to the ways in which they can connect. And the way in which they can connect is through the fact that he was MI6, through the fight training, and in this case, through the cipher. So while there's this bad blood, he's like, you're not my father, which is this very painful thing for, his, for, for, for Alfred to hear. Um, and in many ways, he knows he's not the father because he knows he failed him as a father. Um, they do find a way to connect when it comes to this kind of detail, which is the, the sleuthing, the crime telling. And so my hope would be, you know, would have been as a, we're creating this relationship, that this is the foundation for how not only is Gordon clearly his partner they're like two cops in a way but that alfred is a key partner of his as well and that these are really the only people he has any kind of intimate contact with but it's very fractured because bruce honestly does not want to let himself get close to anyone because he doesn't want to make himself be vulnerable and so this idea here of dory and alfred and bruce to me that was sort of like there's a great documentary called gray gardens about this uh, mother and daughter who live in this old decaying sort of manner they've and and they seemed like this kind of strange dysfunctional odd group and i figured well that's really all that's left of the waynes you know this would have once when he was a child would have been filled with staff but now it's just bruce and dory and alfred and they're just a very strange trio um so that was sort of the fun of, of that was to sort of say again how do we do 
the wanes in a way that feels fresh and felt like it could be iconic and familiar, but also um, a new take. The, the working out of these clues was one of the tricky things about the script, and we were reading, um, you know, riddle books and, uh, and that idea of the, of the cipher and how the, how the cipher could be a word that was made up of letters and all that. That was, doing a Riddler story is a pretty fun sort of challenge, but it's also, the script took an incredibly long time to write, and part of it was because so much was dependent upon all these little details, all these little clues. Um, and they were really fun to lay out, but they were challenging. I mean, it's funny even here, like shooting a Batman film, you look at this and you think, oh, it's fine, so Batman is just looking, you know, he's got his UV light, he's looking for, for clues. But honestly, even Rob just getting in this position <laughs> was brutally difficult. My memory of shooting this scene was how impossible it was in a bat suit. In fact, even his ears fitting into this Aston Mar Martin was very difficult. And um, so there, there are all these things that you just, like I said, there's nothing practical about being Batman. And yet the whole thing was, how do we make him look cool as Batman? How do we make it seem practical? And how do we... You know, how, how does all that function? So actually working with Greg, we spent a lot of time um, figuring out when the light hit Rob in a way where it kind of didn't make him look cool, where you looked at him and you thought, well, that just looks ridiculous. And then there were other times when the light hit him just in this way that sort of gave him just enough of that mystery. So even every detail of how to light the close-up, how to get Rob in the position that he needed to be in, in a suit that has ears attached to his head, that has, you know, difficulty, you know, sort of moving, even though we worked really hard with, with Glenn Dillon and, and Dave Crossman, who, who designed the suit, to allow him to fight and have a kind of real mobility, there's, it's still limited, and he still has a cape. Like, there's a lot of things that makes it very hard to get into positions, and so you don't think about how crazy it is to do the simplest things, but things on the page that look like they would be very simple were incredibly challenging. And this, this idea was, from the beginning, one of the ideas that I thought would be fun, which was if it's year one, I mean, of year two for Batman, then the rogues gallery characters, it's not his origin, that already happened, but the rogues gallery characters, when I was doing a lot of reading in the comics, um, one of the things I was seeing is that there's a lot of origin stories to the rogues gallery characters where their characters sort of were created, their personas were created in dialogue with Batman, the appearance of this masked vigilante gave the idea. He inspires um, the rogues gallery characters to adopt personas. So the Riddler calling himself the Riddler is in a way inspired by the fact that there is a vigilante who has become known as the Batman in this city. And I thought that the opportunity to have all of these characters in the early stages, so like the Penguin could be a mid-level criminal who wasn't yet the kingpin that we know he's going to become because we know how much fans have such familiarity with who these characters become ultimately. So the idea of having him be an, a, a sort of empresario, he's running this club, he's working for Falcone, but he's not yet what he's going to become, that was sort of the fun of, of doing that. And, and in casting Colin, originally I hadn't thought that we would um, make him up to the degree that we did. I just thought that what we would do, you know, when I met Colin, he had, he grew this insane beard, this, he looked really amazing. And he was, he also had gained weight. And I was like, wow, he, he looked amazing. And I was like, hey, you know, I think it'd be good if you kept on some of that weight. Um, it was for another film that he was doing. And he said, at the time, he sort of was open to it, but then after doing the role, he felt that it was really hurting him health-wise. And so I had just thought that what we really do is he would keep that weight, and then Mike Marino, who was going to be doing the prosthetics, I wanted him to be, to have kind of a nose that was kind of like John Cazal, who plays Fredo in The Godfather. I kind of saw this kind of connection between him and like um, uh, Bob Hoskins in The Long Good Friday, kind of a gangster story. And so I thought, wow, we take some of these elements. And then Mike went off, and he sculpted the face you're looking at right there. And I was like, oh my God. You, and it just blew me away. I thought, wow. And then I got really worried. I said, wait, I want to be able to make sure that Colin is going to be able to act through this makeup. 
And he said, oh, no, 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 we will. He goes, the latex I use is the softest kind of latex. And I also make sure that parts of his face are Colin's face. So expressions he's making, you'll see his expressions. So I was like, well, it, that's one of those things that you think you'll believe it when you see it. When I saw Colin for the first time in this makeup, and actually when he came onto the set, people did not know it was Colin. People thought it's, it wasn't one of these things where you looked at him and you thought, oh, we have to light this and make it look real. He looked real from the get-go. And I really think this is some of the most amazing character makeup I have ever seen. And what's an interesting thing is that I met with Colin. We met at the Soho Hotel in, in London to talk about the role. And I, I, I wanted to talk to him about being the character. And we talked for quite a while. And then he agreed to do it. And I was really excited because I, I, I love Colin. I think he's a fantastic actor. And then we had a couple of rehearsals. But the truth of the matter is, is that the way I saw Colin Farrell in this movie for the year and a half that it took to shoot because of, you know, we had the pandemic and it got extended. I only ever saw him looking like this. So when I see him as Colin now, it's not this guy. I know this guy because not only that, Colin spoke mostly in this voice as well. And so he just became this character. And I remember on the last day, we shot the interrogation scene later in the film under the bridge at the end of the Batmobile. Uh, not under the bridge, but in, the, in that kind of abandoned tenement. And um, at the end of it, I gave him a big hug, and I said, this is very sad for me because I know that I'm not going to see this character again. I can't wait to see you, Colin, but I have to say goodbye to this character, at least until if and when we ever do another version of this character. I'm saying goodbye now. And he said, yeah, this has been a, quite a strange experience. It was really uh, pretty powerful and, and, and pretty cool. And I have to say, Mike Marino... His work is astonishing. It's really, I mean, I don't think you could look at this movie at any point and say, oh yeah, it's makeup. It, you're just like, who is that guy? And, um, and it, it transformed him. It's funny, when I looked at the, he sent me this iPhone video and he had been working on the dialect and the moment that he had, the, he saw himself in the mirror, he just started talking. Now in this shot right here, up there in the left, that was the Riddler. I did a thing where I had Paul go up into, I, I figured, okay, so Paul's been casing this place for months, uh, not Paul, but Edward Nashton, the Riddler, has been casing this place for months because he's been, he's been watching the Penguin, he's been watching the drug deals go down, he's been watching, looking for Falcone, and so I figured, oh, it'd be great because he rents this apartment in close proximity to the Iceberg Lounge and to the Shoreline Lofts. What if he's in this shot? So uh, that was something that we, we did on a set, and then that space only existed on that set. By the way, I just have to say, this set that James Chinlin built, and all the sets you've seen so far, I mean, the mayor's apartment, the Bat Cave, the interior for Wayne Manor, um, this whole back lot that you're looking at right here, it was all built in London. And it was all James Chinlin's incredible designs. And he is just an amazing, amazing production designer who I've been fortunate to work with since Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. And, and it was one of those interesting things on that movie. We met, he was already, I came into that movie late because Rupert Wyatt left the film and then I came in with a new take and he was already on. So starting with that film, um, on every film I've done since then, on that film and then on uh, War for the Planet of the Apes and on Batman, as, I would, as I'm writing, um, I bring on uh, James Chinlin and he and I, I sent him pages and we start a dialogue. He starts sending me images. And um, he, he starts sending me images of different things, different drawings and, and different uh, conceptual, beautiful, beautiful drawings. And they inspire me as, as I'm writing. And, um, and he did that on this. And I have to say the other thing he did on this, which was really amazing for me. It's the first time I've done it to this extent. Because when I do previs, I like to sit with the... Um, the previous artist who runs the game engine and I like to choose the camera angles and then we choose all these still shots so I can be in the set. But there was something different on this film where James actually designed the sets themselves in 3D. So we could, I never had this experience before, we put on the, you know, the VR glasses and I could walk through the sets before they were ever built. And we would sit there with the script and I would act out bits of it and I'd say, oh, this doesn't work because he's got a, I need an entrance over here. And then James would in real time, he'd either take the notes or he'd make some of those changes. Um, it was an incredible experience to be able to be in the spaces before they were built. And then I found that experience to be so incredible because I could actually stand in the space that I, I started using VR 
as my way of storyboarding. And so I would go in and put lenses on, and Greg and I, you know, we tested a lot of lenses, and the look of the film is very much, you know, we wanted the film to be anamorphic, and we wanted the film to have this kind of sort of 1970s sort of policier thriller noir, like a neo-noir that was like Clute or Taxi Driver or All the President's Men um, and or Chinatown. And so we wanted it to have that kind of vibe. And so we had these lenses. And then once we got a sense of what lenses we're going to use, we gave the specs for those lenses to VR. And then I could go into VR and put the lenses on and walk through the space. And I set all of my angles in that way. So I was able to, I mean, we did that. We did that throughout the movie. But like, if you look at the opening murder, the, long before I ever went to London, before that set was built, I was able to sit out there and scope those shots and look at those different things. And then with those VR grabs, which were essentially storyboards, I could then come to the set and then I would talk to, about, talk to Greg about them and then he would say, well, let's, let's find those shots. And we would get the lenses and then sometimes we'd say, you know, it's even better on this lens. Or, and we would try all of these different things. But I was able to storyboard the whole movie in VR, which I'd never been able to do before. And it was incredible. It was, it was a special experience because I'm a very literal person. I love to walk into a space and put on a lens and have an actor step to his left, step to his right, look for the shot and be intuitive. And that's very difficult when you're doing that in a VR space. And I've had to do it before, but I've always found it to be very challenging because you're not actually in the space. But now with this tool, with VR, it, it's available to you. You can actually stand in the space. And I think this is gonna happen more and more for, I think, you know, the thing is, is that I think this technology is gonna be enable it to happen even for smaller films, you know, on, on War for the Planet of the Apes, we were able to scan roughly the area where we were doing the opening battle scene. And I was able to set all those shots because we had scanned that area. And I think you could take the rough layouts of sets you were going to build and do a very simple layout in VR. And it, on an independent film, you could go into VR and you could set, knowing your lenses, you could set a lot of your storyboards. And um, it's a pretty great way to do it because the only other way to do it is either do it on the day of or of course in your prep and on these movies they're so um they're just so huge that to be able to spend as much time as you want to beforehand on every set given how much preparation is required especially in a mystery film like this where every detail matters you know what your shot of the clue the when he's looking at the car the shots looking up at him the, the details of the of the blood on the floor um, and how the how the how the, the the Tucker tool leaves this mark, that all has to be. You don't make that up on the day because if you did, you would be shooting what was supposed to be, you know, like a a two day scene would be like a week and you'd be in trouble. And I, I have to say that even within that, I definitely went over on these crime scenes. They were they were much more detail oriented than ever I had ever thought they would be, and they were challenging. And so this VR tool, I, I'm excited for what I think it's going to mean for for filmmakers of all budget ranges. And um, it's something that I hope that I'll carry into all the films, you know, that, that I do. So again, the idea of Selena Kyle in the story is she is not yet Catwoman, right? So we wanted those scenes when he's watching her through the window, of course she has the cats. She puts on a motorcycle suit because she goes out and is obviously a thief. Um, and, and willing, is trying to become anonymous. I wanted it to be practical. So she doesn't want to be seen in that helmet. She's transformed from how she looks at the club. Um, but that, all of that stuff was about giving you the seeds for Selena. Like when she's opening the safe and you see the ears on the back of that ski uh, mask, the idea is to hint at it. And you see that all the elements of Selena are there, but she's not yet Catwoman. Um, and that was, that was one of the sort of key things. And, and actually this exploration, had a lot to do with my discussions with Zoe. And in fact, the idea of the wigs themselves came from Zoe. Uh, she came in and, you know, in that image where he's looking at her in the tank top through the window, that was something, it was written in the script that he would watch her as she was transforming and she would come out into a suit that was evocative of a cat suit, but wasn't literally a cat suit, it was this motorcycle bat suit, a cat suit. And, um, she was like, well, what I'd love to do is I'd love him to see me in that tank top that's right out of this image from Selena in the East End in the Mazzuccelli drawings from year one. And so we did that, and she said, I'd love to have that year one haircut. And I was like, totally. 
let's do it. And then she also brought in this series of wigs. And one of the wigs is a wig that comes up from the club when she has that bob, that kind of little crazy uh, sort of red scarlet wig that just pops in this crazy way. And it was an exciting exploration to see how those wigs transformed her. And so I was like, look, here's what I, I want to do all of that. We tested it all, and Greg tested all this light on her face. And so whereas Bruce Batman kind of sort of came from sort of this kind of red family, there was something about the cyan color on her, and that became sort of her signature color. And um, I said, what I want to do is I want to meet you in a, in a wig that the audience will think is your actual hair. And then you'll remove the wig, and we'll see the year one hair. And from there forward, we'll see that she has a chameleon-like quality where she puts on these different wigs where from that point forward they could be quite theatrical and so she wears the pink wig after that and she wears the that very intense scarlet red wig but in also in my discussions with zoe um she the cats were really important to her and um they were in the story but she said i want to understand what it means and she goes to me i'm thinking it's because i collect strays because i was a stray and i love that and she said, do you think I could say that in this scene? And I said, sure, I'd love to write that in, but what's going to provoke it? And this is her line that's coming up right here. She said, oh, that's easy. You could just have Rob say, you got a lot of cats. You got a lot of cats. And so then she could say, I have a thing about strays. And that's how we got in this stuff about uh, the backstory, which was all about, really it's about her relationship with Annika as well, which is that Annika is we find out later, not so different from her mother, who she lost when she was very young, that she's like Bruce in that she is an orphan, but she doesn't have, she didn't have any of the resources that, uh, that Bruce had. And so he has this sort of image of her, which is very much taken from um, the Alan Pakula movie, Clute, uh, starring Jane Fonda, which Jane Fonda gives an incredible performance and in which Donald Sutherland plays the title character, Clute, he's a detective and he's investigating the murder uh, and disappearance of this man and, and comes in contact with Brie Daniels, who um, Jane Fonda plays. And in it, he's judging her because in that, in that story, she's a prostitute. But similarly, um, he's judging her because he's, he's very, you know, uh, Clute is, is very, in a certain way, sheltered. He comes from a much smaller town, and he's not sophisticated. And New York is a, is a really tough place to survive. And there was something about that and how it applied to Selena in Gotham and the idea that Bruce, you know, Bruce has been, he's gone through the trauma of what he's lost, but he has a safety net, and that's the wealth that comes with being a Wayne. And it's actually a luxury that allows him to do something that you wouldn't normally get to do, if this had happened to you, the idea of being a vigilante is a pure luxury. Building that car, the suit, the whole thing. He doesn't even have to hold down a job, right? He's doing all of this because he can. And it's the only way to make sense of his life. Selena didn't have it that easy. When she lost her mother and she was in the orphanage and she had to get by, she had to become a survivor. And so some of that was to learn how to transform, to, you know, sort of fit into different situations, those wigs, be a chameleon. Um, and also, when she needed to be, to be a thief, and she becomes this cat burglar. And so he's judging her because he's thinking, oh, well, if she's in this world, if he's finding her in this world of the mob and the characters you see in the Iceberg Lounge, then he's assuming that she, she must be of low morals. And actually, when you look at the story, everything he thinks about her is wrong. And that did have this connection to Clute in that Clute sort of judged her and it didn't keep him from falling in love with her and seeing the person that she was and starting to understand what she had done just to survive in this rough place. And so it's different, but it was ins it inspired a bit of how we, how we sort of tried to portray Selena in this city. Um, and with the difference being that, that she is a very empowered character that, um, you know, Zoe has this great strength and when she came in and she auditioned for that character, she actually did, screen test with Rob, um, who was in this crazy makeshift cowl, um, and she was wearing a kind of sort of leather jacket and had to take on the, the helmet on and off of the motorcycle. Um, but she had that confidence right from the beginning, and there was this great chemistry between them. They were friends, and you could feel they knew each other. There was something between them that came across on camera, and she, she had that fire that Selena had, and so she really grabbed the role.
And this idea here of the contact lenses, to me, what was important, I, for me, in telling a story, it's certainly true of noirs, right, uh, to do a point of view story. But for me, it's just, it's important in general, f in terms of what I like to do storytelling wise, which is to put the audience in the shoes of a character who you are not. And I do a lot of really direct point of view camera. You know, people will look into the lens. You'll see the perspective of Batman as he's looking at something or the looking back up at him from the perspective of the object he's looking at. And all of that is to make you feel like what it feels like to be him. And in this scene, I wanted to put, I wanted to use that device, the contact lenses, to do something different, which was to take Batman and put him in Selena's shoes to have Again, the movie's an awakening for him. He has no idea of the privilege that he has. And so to put on, to have her put on those contact lenses and go into that club, he's doing it to scope the place. He can actually be her, live through her eyes in order to see what's going on in that club. But he has an unexpected experience, which is that he suddenly gets to feel through her eyes what it feels like to be objectified, to have those corrupt businessmen and politicians and mobsters down in the club um, staring at her body, looking at her like she's a piece of meat. And um, that idea of giving him, giving him even just that little bit of awakening of him of having to have his sympathies extended so that he can understand the way that she's had to survive, that she knows how to turn on that image on and off because of survival instincts of what to do, but the discomfort of feeling that leering gaze that, by the way, the audience itself, of course, in these movies is always guilty of, right? That's always the thing. It's, that's a Hitchcockian thing. Hitchcock would put you in the voyeur's gaze and you'd be implicated. You would feel like, okay, the guilt of wanting to stare and observe, like we all have that impulse, but then the idea of that, the discomfort of being watched, of being the object of somebody's gaze is a very, uh, unsettling thing and I really wanted Batman to feel these eyes in a way on him to say like oh this is this is an experience and he's here he's compelling he's saying wait if you look away I can't get the IDs that's not gonna work for me and then he starts to realize oh <laughs> look at these creeps and so that was one of the that was one of the tricks of the movie that I wanted to try you know from the from the from the script stage which was to not only tell a point of view Batman's story, but to have Batman live a bit through her point of view. Jesus, I hate drop heads. Really? And this was a very challenging scene to put together because I wanted to limit our points of view to these shots that are either from the image intensifier, which are the contact lenses looking. You'd be watching Batman watching the computer, or you're leading these shots on her. And there's a couple shots where I broke that rule, and I have, like, in a second... Um, Peter Sarsgaard will come over and I actually covered him just in case and I realized that I, I wanted it and needed it but I tried to be very rigorous and we were dealing with the sound on this. One of the things that was challenging was that the more that we treated the sound as if it was coming from inside the computer, the more distant you felt. And I wanted this to be an immersive experience so I talked to the sound guys about how can we make it feel like we are in that club with her. Where, like Batman by her wearing those contact lenses and wearing some sort of listening device was inside the club and so they took the sound and in a way when he talks to her he's like the voice of God he's all around her so when you listen to this movie in Atmos his voice is is, is in a way you would never normally play it which is that he's all around her he's in her head and everything that she's hearing he's hearing as if he's got like stereo headphones on as if he's in the space with them and that was so that the audience would not feel distant from this experience and that we'd be connected to it. But we had to arrive at all that. And these are the same sound guys, uh, Will Files and, and Doug Murray, who I've worked with since Cloverfield, actually, which also was a very point of view, rigorous sort of film. And so were the Apes films and Let Me In that I did with them. And so I always love going on an exploration with them on, on sound. And, and even earlier, when, when they first go into the club, the idea of what it sounds like to have... The, the club sound be so almost painfully loud, so you feel like you're really going into the club with him. It, the soundscapes they create, I think, is one more thing that really adds to the point of view experience that you have in the movie, which is exciting for me to, to try and find ways to provoke that so that the movie feels, again, like you're having an immersive experience, you're becoming the characters. 
We had an informant. We have big time information on Salvador Moroni. That's how we got him out of the drops business. This is a scene actually which was it was very challenging. We had rehearsed this scene. And Peter, who I love, we had a wonderful experience on this film. He was like, gosh, I'm not sure about how I'm giving some of this information. And in the rehearsal, I was like, I think this can work because you're high. I think it's going to work because he's on drops. But when we started shooting it, it actually didn't work. Peter was right. And so it's one of those moments where, you know, when you're, it's one thing when you rehearse, you make a change. But when you're on the day and it doesn't work, you can either keep shooting and the scene won't work and six months later you'll either be back reshooting it or you'll have to cut the scene or you'll have to solve it in some other way and i actually one of the things that i've just learned to do is sometimes you have to say okay we have to stop so we shot the scene over the course of two days and on day one i stopped and i just said okay we're, this isn't working uh, peter was right and i just got everyone together and i rewrote the scene we talked about what wasn't working and that whole scene and the way he tells Selena about the rat, which is critical because we have to get this information. The rat is the key to this whole mystery. Um, was completely recreated, and we came back the next day. And it's one of the scary things. You have a you have a crew of, of hundreds of people. There are literally thousands of people who work on the movie, and hundreds of people in the crew. And everybody's waiting while you're shooting something. And sometimes you just have to say, "Uh oh, <laughs> this isn't working," and you just have to say, "Stop." You know. I told you it's a mob spot. You didn't tell me you had a This was a key aspect, too, which was this idea of Batman. He was, again, very inspired by noir. He's assuming that she is, she has low morals. He now thinks that she's involved with Falcone, which, of course, later we're going to find out is she, she is involved with Falcone, but not in the way he was thinking at all, and not in the way we are thinking. We're meant to be in Batman's point of view, so I want you to think when you're watching that part of the movie and he touches her face that, uh-oh, we're in some kind of um, sort of relationship that the two of them have that maybe she regrets, maybe she was involved with him in so ro some romantic way, something that would make us really uncomfortable. And that whole idea, of course, was um, John Turturro, who's a hero of mine, he, he was so fun to work with, and he said, you know, I have this idea that is very upsetting to me, but w what do you think, Zoe, if I touch your face? And Zoe was like, let's do it. And she did, and it was so uncomfortable. And it did exactly... I think what we wanted, which was that in Batman's eyes, it implied something between them. And Batman is really, in certain ways, Bruce is stuck at being 10. So he can't help but be drawn to Selina right from the beginning. And yet he looks at her, he's terribly attracted to her, but he also looks at her um, in this way where he thinks that she's of, of low moral quality. And he's actually feeling quite jealous in that scene. So he's really mad. He feels betrayed by her because he just wants to imagine that she's gonna want him. And then he realizes, wait a minute, you've been with Falcone and you're not what I thought. And so it creates this sort of break in between them. And it begins this sort of continuous sort of jealousy that continues throughout the film. And then later in the film, like, as I was saying in Noir, it was kind of paralleling the relationship of Evelyn Mulray and Jake Giddies. Jake Giddies is assuming that Evelyn is somehow in, involved in in um, in her husband's death, but over the course of the story, you come to realize that that all has more to do with her father and the very upsetting relationship that they have. And he realizes in the end that he needs to be involved in trying to save her, and um, and that he was completely wrong about her. And I wanted the audience and Batman and Bruce to be wrong about Selena Kyle, and and there thereby kind of implicate the audience in trying to assume, oh, okay, well, I'm sure she's. She's immoral or amoral in some way. And there's some truth to that because you have to, you have to ha be willing to find some way to survive in a place as rough of the, as this. But her story is actually quite personal and earned. This whole idea of the meeting in the tower for me was inspired by all the president's men. I wanted this whole mystery of looking for the rat and understanding how these pieces fit and renewal to be like all the president's men when they are following these clues and eventually it leads them to Deep Throat. And I thought, oh, these scenes of the two of them are kind of like uh, Deep Throat in the movie where they meet, um, where Redford's character meets with Deep Throat in the parking garage and they whisper about the conspiracy and how high does it go? How far does the corruption lead? And, um, and so these were fun scenes to write and then 
to shoot with Rob and Jeffrey to really do something I think that hadn't been done in quite the same level that we were going to do, which is that these guys are partners. They're kind of like two cops. It's like, you know, all the president's men, but it's also like the French connection, you know? Uh, and so the idea of them having this kind of implicit trust for each other, while still in certain ways not knowing each other at all, they know each other through the work they do. They trust each other at some deep level. And uh, they're swimming against the tide of corruption, which is enormous. It's just the two of them fighting alone. And that was a fun thing. I, I love that, and I love the music that Michael plays in this scene. He's got that electric guitar to give them kind of the sort of badass edge of these two uh, partners trying to figure out this mystery and just how far it leads. And even the name uh, Coulson and the name, the name Mitchell, they were taken from the true All, all the President's Men story. Um, and I just wanted the, the, I wanted the movie to have that texture where you were, it had the, it felt like a true conspiracy. It felt like it led to government conspiracy that had the ring of truth um, and that, you know, in the case of Watergate, led all the way to the presidency and here leads all the way up to the mayor and then the person who really is the acting mayor, the Noah Cross from uh, Chinatown of our story, which is, who is, who is Carmine Falcone. And this idea here of Bruce finally making an appearance in public as Bruce that's the version of himself. He doesn't. He never goes anywhere just as Bruce, and um, he's only doing it here. He wouldn't do it except he realizes that he's got three personas, and this one actually is valuable because he has access to this high-profile funeral um, and cover. He's got a great cover. Of course, he could be there, and basically, he's going as Batman under the guise of Bruce. And the difficulty of all of that, of course, is that he's not really comfortable being Bruce. And so when he comes uh, to the memorial, you get to see just where that discomfort stems from, which is this idea of the whole world knowing you and knowing the story of your family and you not wanting to be reminded or be part of any of that. Um, and in a certain way, really just wanting to be invisible, to escape from that. You don't want to be vulnerable. You don't want people looking at you, knowing who you are. Um, that's a very vulnerable position to be in. And so for all of the kind of power that seems to come with that kind of celebrity, there's also a tremendous vulnerability. And this particular piece of music that Michael wrote, I felt captured that in such a powerful way. And what's interesting about this piece of music is that Michael wrote it before we filmed a frame. And normally what happens is I show a very long cut of the movie way before it's done to Michael, and he starts writing a suite. And this particular piece of music, Michael wrote, I talked to him extensively about what I was doing, shared some script pages, and he, he wrote this theme uh, before we were shooting and actually had an orchestra record it. And he sent it to me the night before Rob did his screen test as Batman. And I remember um, going to do the test at Warner Brothers. We were doing it on one of the stages and Rob had to wear one of the bat suits. When you do a Batman screen test, people have to see what you look at. The studio wants to see what the actor looks like in a cowl. And we knew Rob was going to look great in a cowl, but we, uh, we had to do it because that's part of what it's always done. It's been done. Uh, Keaton, they didn't do it because I don't know what they did for that, but the, the suits ever since Keaton have built up so that every, you know, Bale had to wear one of the suits and Ben had to wear one of the suits and, uh, and so did Clooney and Kilmer. And so we had all those suits and, and Rob had to put on one of the suits. And I, we went there and that day as I was waiting to go in, Dylan Clark, my partner, my producing partner, pulled up and I said, get in the car. He said, why, what do you got? I said, just sit in the car with me. And as Rob was getting dressed in that suit, we listened to that theme and we were both so moved and we were like, oh my God. And you suddenly feel the whole weight of the history of what you're doing. I mean, the character's been around for over 80 years. It's an enduring myth. And then the movies have been around, you know, since the 80s. I mean, obviously even before then, the 66, Batman 66 was my first introduction, which was the, the uh, movie with Adam West. And of course, I really got to know him from the TV series. And 
there's something about this myth that has that great sort of enduring power. It's a really powerful tale. People are drawn to how cool Batman is, but there's also that vulnerability of what's ha what happened to him as a child that I think connects to people. And there are just all these trappings that just have an enduring quality and have lent themselves to many interpretations and to some great movies and to suddenly be there that day and have that moment where we knew Rob was going to be testing in one of the suits. He actually tested in, um, I had thought it was Clooney's. Rob is convinced it was, um, I'm sorry, I thought it was Kilmer's. He was convinced it was Clooney's because he thought that he was the only one who had the same height, size head. I don't know which it was except that it had nipples. But in any case, um, knowing you're doing that and then listening to that music, you just suddenly stop and you pinch yourself and you're going, wow, we're doing a Batman movie. And one way or another, whether people connect to it or not, we're a part of that lineage, we're a part of that history. And it, it, was, a, it was one of those moments where what Michael had written was so beautiful and it only just pushed us to want to make the movie better and better and better. And it was actually when I started working with Rob on the movie, because of course he did get the role, um, I played him the music as one of the, I mean, I gave him movies and comics and references that I had used when writing. But I gave him the music, and he told me it was one of the most important pieces for him to get into character, to understand. He said there was something so emotional about it that felt like Bruce Wayne to him, and it really helped him. Um, so that's one more amazing way that Michael helped all of us in the movie. So anyway, as I said, the whole idea of this Ave Maria, it, it was one of the things that I knew he, that he had sung the Riddler as a child, and we were going to come back to that. And when I saw the cut of the movie, I realized that there's this moment which we had in the script, which uh, Paul does amazingly, where he sings Ave Maria in this very unsettling way. And I realized that that theme had to start at the beginning of the movie and lead inevitably so that when you finally heard it, there was no question why you were hearing it. And so here we have uh, the children who could be a choir like the choir that Ed Nashton was in as he was a child. And um, I thought that was an important part of the story. Uh, this here, I, I, I love the idea too that, that Martinez, um, Gil, who plays him, I think is so wonderful. When he sees him as a cop in the beginning and, and he's Batman, he's like, hey, you're not allowed in here. And he calls him a freak. But when he sees Bruce Wayne, that's exciting. He's seeing a celebrity. And Gordon is just the flip of that, that Gordon trust Batman and will let him and bring him into a crime scene. But when he sees Bruce Wayne, he has nothing but contempt. He thinks, why is this rich guy, this screw up, probably a drug addict, uh, listening to my conversation with Chief Bach? And he gives him a kind of contemptuous look. And that seems sort of fun. that idea that was Paul up there and that was one of those things where you know determining how much you see of Paul it was a, one of the things I think that really drew Paul to wanting to play the Riddler he was very he connected to the journey but I think also it was one of these things where he was very drawn to this idea which I was in in writing it and in talking to Rob to this idea of I guess what's called mask work, this idea of working behind a mask and how it transforms you and how you lose yourself in it and how, how you become instinctual in it. And so Paul's seen in the movie without that mask so few times. And that moment actually of him up top there, that is Paul. And it was like, how do we make him look iconic without the, map, without the mask on so that you know it's him? And, um, and there was something about him in that coat that... Um, that sort of did it, but you actually see Paul very sparingly in the movie, which is part of the power, because he's he's very um, he's a mystery that's gnawing at Batman. Why is this guy writing to me? Why is he writing to me again and again and again? Because the idea of Batman is, of course, to be anonymous, to come out of the shadows, and then suddenly to have the lens turned on you, to have somebody writing to you and leaving you clues is very unsettling, and we wanted to build the idea that one of the reasons might be that maybe he knows something about him. And to get to a place where it starts to seem almost irrefutable that the Riddler must know who Batman is. So that way, when we find out that isn't the case and that the story is essentially a kind of 
in the Riddler's mind, a love story between the two of them. And by the way, a tragic one, because Batman does not return that affection, that it'll be a shock to the audience. And then you'll realize, well, wait a minute. If he was writing him, it wasn't to tell him, I know who you are. It was because he thought they were partners and something more is coming. And this was a hard scene to shoot, too, because figuring out how to do, like I said, not only is Paul in the movie in very limited ways, but the ways you see him is very limiting as well. You see him basically on, on the cell phone, which has been ringing on Coulson's hand this whole time. You see him on the TV where he makes his kind of social media sort of videos that get picked up by the news. Um, and, and you, you know, you see him very, very fleetingly. You see him over a computer screen. You see him in Arkham. It's, you know, there were very specific tools that Paul had. And I think he was excited about the challenge of conveying something through that. Um, but when we shot this scene, even shooting this scene was a challenge because the three actors had to play off of each other in what was a very long dialogue scene. I mean, this is almost like a long little 10 minute sort of scene, like a, like a, like a one act play, which is the, you know, the, the, the death of Coulson. Here he is waiting vulnerably, Batman comes in and then they answer the phone and then this series of riddles is presented and he has to try and solve them and we're getting at the mystery that the Riddler's trying to lead Batman toward and it's happening significantly on a cell phone. Oh, and I needed the Riddler because this is one of his key appearances to be felt on this scene and so we actually shot this scene with the cell phone. Paul was in another part of the set and the actors were talking to Paul um, over the cell phone and they were playing off of each other and it was a uh, it was a very challenging and unconventional way of shooting the scene and Paul's actually in control of the cell phone so he picked up the cell phone and started filming himself the way that he wanted to be seen and um, that was all part of how the Riddler would be presenting himself to Batman and then I wanted that glimpse where you realize wait a minute it's not just Batman and Coulson but the city that must be seeing this, that he's live streaming and this idea of this almost Instagram-like sort of approval where you're seeing the hearts. There are some people out there saying like this place is corrupt and they're looking for blood. And I wanted that in a way to speak to, I think, something that for me feels very much of our time, which is the way that we communicate on social media and the way events can become viral in a very unsettling way, and the way the mob mentality can sort of spread uh, through social media because there's a kind of emotional distance that allows you to not really have empathy for the people on the other end. And so people can root for Coulson here to be murdered because they can say, oh, he was corrupt, he deserves it, and there are people who are waiting to see him be destroyed, to see him be blown up. And yet the goal here for me, and what I think Peter did so beautifully, was that he, for all of his flaws, he has made the wrong choices. He has done some terrible things and been, been part of a terrible, um, corrupt system. But you also see his humanity. He's desperate. And so I wanted you also to feel that while you didn't admire him, you could feel for him. And that when he talks about having his family, that Batman can see for a moment that this guy is whatever's going on, he's so frightened by the depth of this corruption. This conspiracy is so dark that in order to save his family, Coulson is actually willing to die, that the choice to not give the answer is somehow preferable to giving the answer because, as Peter then says, if he gives it the information, it's going to affect not just him, but the people he loves. And so that idea would speak about some power that goes well beyond what any of them are thinking. And then to find that way to have these interstitial, almost unsettlingly funny interjections by, <laughs> by the Riddler saying, 58 seconds where they'd be creepy, but also oddly funny. Like this was a very challenging scene. And I have to say, I think the actors were amazing. And, and even the idea of, um, you know, Peter has certain things in there where he's, he doesn't understand the thing about bribes, so he doesn't realize he's being asked to say what the bribe was. He's so he's saying like, oh, is the answer bribes? And so everything is just, how do I get out? How do I get out of this situation? And he came up with that sort of take, which I thought was so great. 
And um, and as you can see from the tears and from every just the fluids coming out of his face, Peter gave his all. We shot the scene for about three days straight, and he, every take, he was giving of himself in this way that was like a very emotionally pitched sort of level. I was super impressed. This is one of those things too where I wanted to put you visually inside. This is like classic noir where your sort of main character, your detective uh, has an experience that knocks him out and then suddenly we are in his eyes and you're with him as he blocks out and that ringing of the ears and the sound. Doug and Will did such a great sound treatment here, I thought, of being in the most vulnerable spot, which is that if he'd been knocked out and brought back to headquarters, right now they could take that mask off and I wanted this sort of tease of being able to hear the voices and feel helpless, like, oh my God, any second he's gonna be exposed. And then he gets the resources to sort of jolt back into, almost like an adrenaline rush, back into the fight. This scene was very exciting to me, just visually because I thought it spoke again in the idea of trying to do that kind of 70s sort of policier, thriller, neo-noir, this idea of Batman in, a, in a, sea of, a sea of cops wearing those kind of leather jackets and some of them in their classic uh, East Coast style uh, badges on their, on their hats. I just thought Batman in that sea of unfriendly faces, people who, who want to see this guy disappear, was a great sort of, almost like Serpico or something, seemed like a fun tone that we hadn't seen exactly that way in these movies. Again, in the writing, this was a fun moment because I wanted the audience to briefly think, is there any chance that Gordon is not on his side? And then when we were doing this, I was so, <laughs> I was so, I was so amused by the way he says, I gotta get you out of here. And then he says, I put a lot of heat, but it's this smile from Rob at the idea that he might even enjoy punching Gordon in the face uh, in a kind of fun way, like, oh, you want me to punch you in the face? Great, okay, ready, I'll do it. And uh, there's something, again, about that partnership and the two of them willing to do whatever it takes together to get through this, to fight through this, that I th sort, of, sort of thought was a, a kind of fun pa partnership we hadn't ever seen. And I just think that the, the relationship that, that Jeffrey um, and Rob created, the energy between them, is a, is a very special one. And I think, again, is a version of this relationship we hadn't quite seen. It, it was very much inspired by year one because Gordon in year one has a great swimming against the stream, imperfect quality. And I think the way that, uh, that Jeffrey talked about it that I loved was this idea that Gordon is always just a little bit in over his head, but he never stops. And you know, Batman has all these resources and Gordon just has his gun, his badge and that police issue car. And, um, and yet he's still out there on the front lines doing whatever he has to do. And, there's a kind of joy in watching somebody kind of go to those lengths to try and do whatever he can to, to do the right thing. And uh, he's kind of inspiring in that way. Ideas of this practical Batman, we watched a lot of um, wingsuiting sequences and I wanted to take, you know, our, our Alexa LF with anamorphic lenses and make it like a GoPro that you would see and we did all these angles and figured out how to do them so that this would feel very practical. And then I wanted him to have, it totally makes no sense that this guy thinks he's gonna have a soft landing with a wingsuit, you can't really do that. And so uh, we wanted him to feel the pain because this iteration of Batman, he, he takes as much punishment as he deals out. And um, there was something in that that seemed like it was sort of a perfect version of the, 
year two Batman, that he, he's still figuring all this out, and he's flying by the seat of his pants, and he's risking himself in ways that make no sense whatsoever. He's not in control, and there's a kind of vicarious thrill that I think is part of that thing that I always felt to make the audience feel like, hey, if I had what he had, maybe I could be Batman. <laughs> and then you look at it, you're like, oh, that would hurt. <laughs>
chasing or a race, you know, if you're seeing a racing scene and you've seen those those GoPros that are mounted in the in the car, I wanted the I wanted hard mounts like mounted on her motorcycle, hard mounts that are mounted with her on her handlebars here, watching her drive off. Hard mounts. That's this is a this is a this is a follow vehicle. So we have some of these shots, but then suddenly this shot here, we're mounted hard on the car. This is mounted in the back, looking at the back. That's mounted over his shoulder. That's mounted on the front of the car, a bumper mount. This is mounted on the rear, uh, rear bumper. So that all of these shots are all totally practical shots. But then we did these incredible things with Weta. Weta added all of this rain and did all of this stuff to take, you know, hydroplaning was one of the concepts that was super important to me because I thought that would be scary, the idea of being out of control on that freeway. So we had to have a baseline of rain and Weta, in the places where we didn't have rain, we did wet downs, we have water on the glass. They added all this rain. The, the work they did, I think, in this sequence is astonishing. I mean, it's like all the rain you're seeing there is added. None of that is, is there. There's water uh, that was on the ground. They did wet downs, but there's no water that's hitting the lens um, that's from the rain itself. I mean, we might have gotten the lens wet, but that was the texture. How could we make you feel like you were just in this experience with them? And this idea, I guess, is very French Connection inspired because of that, that scene in the French Connection where he, he chases uh, the shooter who was taking a shot at him and, and hits, uh, I believe, the woman. So somebody's making an assassination attempt on Popeye Doyle. And he commandeers a car and chases him. And it's all about that obsessiveness. The whole idea of making this personal, the idea that Penguin was about to kill Selina and Batman is going to come out of the shadows like a monster and basically do that to intimidate the penguins so that Selina is not injured and then he's going to get him <laughs> at all costs and so this idea of the penguin is so desperate he'll he's doing all these dangerous things and Batman is trying to pull right up to that edge too and he doesn't want to hurt anyone, but you see how close he can. I mean, this is a crazy chase that they take. So you see the obsessive lengths at this stage in his career. He really is all about vengeance. And so this chase has to be born out of that idea of obsessive rage and vengeance. And he is not going to stop at anything. And then the idea is to depict that car the way we depict the suit which is out of something like a horror movie. And I wanted this to be, it was, it was inspired by, in some ways by like Stephen King's uh, Christine. And there was a, a movie made of that as well, where you see the car kind of on fire coming out of the shadows. And I said to Rob Alonzo and to Dom Tui, who is our practical effects supervisor, I want this car to jump through flames. And I didn't know if we'd have to do it CG or what we have to do, but I want it to be like a vision from hell. And then Dom said, I think we can do it. And in this crazy sequence that comes up, you'll look at some stuff here, and some of it is CG, some of it's not. There's always, almost always a baseline shot that we shot that then something was done to. But the actual jump through the fire that you see it was done for real. They, they changed the suspension on the Batmobile. And amazingly, they were able to jump it through a wall of fire which you're about to see right here. And this is actually a practical 50-50 shot on Colin. There's a big fire explosion going behind him, and Colin is driving that car, and then when he looks in this mirror, we actually did shoot a shot on a mirror mount. That car is jumping through that fire. That isn't a CG shot, and this isn't a CG shot either. There's a little supplement, a little bit of rain on the ground and that kind of stuff, but the, the basic part of the shot, we did. Um, and that was... I was amazed by what they were able to, to, to sort of to do. And all of it was, how can we make this be like a Stephen King moment? You see that the Batmobile, which makes no practical sense to drive around, and it's meant to terrify, to intimidate and pursue. And that moment was a, a perfect visualization of that in my mind. It was like, how can we jump through fire? And then this idea of being in Penguin's point of view ended up really being one of my favorite shots in the movie, which is just this idea of the, you're in the penguin's eyes here and you see in this mythic way what having this sort of masked caped vigilante looks like as he comes toward you he's like a force of nature and all of that rain 
and it's raining upwards. And then he just kind of bends down and what Michael Cicchino tells me is his favorite moment, which is <laughs> Rob just staring in at him before he looks at the penguin and then suddenly puts a hood on him and they show up here. And the reason I chose the penguin for this particular suspect was I thought in order for the audience to believe that the rat, which is one of the key puzzle pieces of this story, that the informant that we're looking for is a character that it isn't, because they need to, you know, as you know, Jake Giddies and like so many noir stories, they're wrong a million times before they're right, because that's the whole idea about being a detective. You, you try out sort of scenarios and you play them out until you disprove them, until you find out what it actually is. And so they might be the world's greatest detectives, but they're wrong a lot of the time. And in this case, I knew that I wanted the audience to believe that they were right. And so I thought, well, the way to do that is to use an iconic villain. And so Colin and the Penguin are in the movie in a very, very targeted way. He, they're here um, to show you that this rat could very well be this mid-level, not yet kingpin version of the penguin, that somehow he got himself into some trouble, uh, and to get out of it, he maybe cooperated with the police, and the police were using him to rug the drunk business. All of it was totally believable as a possible path, given everything we've seen so far. And by making him a, making him a prominent character, um, I felt that the audience would think it was a, a real possibility. Um, but then here they reach a dead end. <laughs> and I love, I love the way he says, no habla espanol, fellas. But that whole idea that they'd miss this detail about El Rata, which of course would be La Rata. And as I said, there's only so many appearances by the Riddler, and this is one of them, you know? He's, he's this specter, and all he really is in here is uh, he starts as a question mark on a screen. And so, you know, there are all these tools of, of how to keep this guy veiled from us, but to have, how to have him keep burrowing into Batman's psyche. And um, it, it was one of the challenges, even in editing the movie, was just to make sure that we were feeling enough of this character because this this plot is so complex. Doing a noir <laughs> was, I had no idea just how challenging it would be to take all of these characters and try to create this sort of noir tapestry of these characters that I was hoping would feel almost like an old Warner Brothers gangster movie. Um, and use that to lead to a path that would eventually take us not only to the truth of who the Riddler is and why he's doing this, but also would become a case that while at first he's drawn into it because this killer is writing directly to him, that it would eventually get to this place where it would be an awakening for Bruce, where he would find out things and potential things about his own family that were going to shake him to his core. I mean, the very reason he becomes Batman is because of what happened to him. And suddenly the nature of his family is called into question and is the very idea of being Batman is all of that based on some kind of lie. I knew that in order to have Batman have an arc, that this story couldn't continue to be just a history of Gotham. It had to be a history that touched on the Waynes. And, and that, was, that was the conception for the beginning, but landing that was, was not an easy thing to figure out how to do. And, we spent a long time plotting that out to make sure that that story connected. It was a challenging thing. And then this orphanage here, the idea being that this is where, this would be the original Wayne Manor um, before they moved to Wayne Tower and that they donated it and it became the Gotham Orphanage. And all of these things seem like they're benevolent things. They're trying to give, you know, the, the Bruce's father, Thomas Wayne, starts his mayoral campaign by, by creating a charitable fund to get money to people in need and renewal. And they gave, 
you know, their old um, manor, their beautiful old home, which now has fallen into total disrepair and decay and is the home for drug addicts, uh, dropheads, um, that all of that was donated as a way to try and help people in the city. So then why is the Riddler so upset with the Waynes? And then the idea is that because none of it is what it seems. That these, The idea from the beginning for me was to have the Riddler indict these supposed pillars of legitimacy and power in the city and expose them as being liars and fraudulent. And that it starts with the mayor, it goes to the commissioner, then to the DA, and then it goes to the idea of Thomas Wayne himself, the, one of the founding members, what his family, one of the founding fathers of the city, not Thomas himself, but the history, the lineage of his family and what he represents. He, the idea of him being like the Kennedys, um, uh, their, their family being like the Kennedy, Kennedys, American royalty. And to find out that they, in this story, weren't at all that they sort of portrayed themselves as being, what does that mean and how will that affect Bruce? And the idea is that this is actually the room where it all began, where, as a child, that, those, th that choir you just heard singing Ave Maria, among them was, was Riddler. And he was one of those kids, and he was listening to the speech, and he thought that things were going to change for him, that Thomas Wayne basically made all these... And there was this, this kid, Bruce Wayne, who he was looking over and thinking, gosh, if only I could be him and be on the other side of things, and maybe this is all going to work out for me and things are going to change now that Thomas Wayne is saying he's going to help us. And, of course, none of that happened. And so it, it all seemed that uh, Thomas Wayne lied to them is the way that the Riddler sees it. That little uh, <laughs> Shakespeare bust there is one of the um, Easter eggs for me that I asked James Chinlin to put there. It's like the, the bust in uh, the Adam West library uh, study that you pull the head back and that's how you open the bookcase to get down to the Batcave. So I want us to have that Shakespeare bust because I wanted, um, for people who'd been fans since they were kids, older kids like me, uh, people who were around in the 60s, that they, um, that they would would recognize that detail and uh, see that somewhere embedded in this was a bit of, of the Batman from their childhood. And that note is meant to be one more clue that he must know that Bruce and Batman are one and the same. It's just meant to get under his skin. And then later we find out, of course, that see you in hell was his clue for uh, the description of what it'll be when he is in Arkham, which is certainly hell for him, but was thinking the place where the two of them would finally meet and, and um begin their emotional romance really the the connection that he believes they have he thinks he feels like they're they're a brotherhood they're together they're they're one in the same which is an idea that bruce of course resists to the core And so from this section forward, the film becomes a deeper sort of excavation of the Wayne aspect of things. And he 
His desperation is driving him to try and understand how could his family's legacy, how could his father connect to the corruption that he is seeing? And he's really in a free fall, really, in this section of the film. And it, this section touches on all of these personal things. He has this tremendous guilt about what just happened to Alfred, how he couldn't save him, um, and is also incredibly unsettled to discover that his father could have any sins that would connect to the corruption that he... He's so, he sees things in such moral white and black. He, um, he's very naive in a way. Again, he's, it's like he's 10. Um, in certain ways, he's stuck. Uh, and he doesn't see the world in all the shades that are there. And the movie, the story of the movie is meant to blow that apart for him. And Selena functions that way for him. And this mystery kind of blows that up for him as well. This was a challenge as we were writing that was a trick to figure out, okay, so how can we get them back together again? And so we always made sure that she'd held on to those contact lenses and that she then set them up and they're beginning to send out a signal again and that they would then meet. I love the way Rob does this here, the way she, she can't see him, but he can see her, but you can see how affected by her he is. And he's so jealous. This scene is really about how he feels betrayed by her because he realizes, oh, she must have been involved with Falcone, with Penguin, and he's just intensely jealous because he's so drawn to her, but he also has a completely naive view of her. It's like he, he imagines somehow there's this romance between them, and uh, it really has a basis in nothing other than his, his immaturity. And he's judging her here that she... She should have known better, and, and uh, he's, he's very cold to her here, and, and she is about to blow that up with the truth of exactly what that relationship that she had with Falcone was. And, and she calls him out on this idea that he, 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 he talks as someone who has been sheltered. <laughs> he had that huge safety net, so she's, she's smart enough, streetwise enough to understand that this guy is as connected as they are in certain ways that neither of them trust anyone but some part of him doesn't seem to understand what it takes to survive in Gotham and this part of the story is totally taken from the comics I mean it's an interesting thing I spent a very long time at the beginning reading comics and this story I believe it actually is in I think it's referred to in The Long Halloween, but also in Dark Victory and When in Rome, but this connection that Selina realizes that Falcone is her father, that idea I loved. And what's so interesting is that those comics were written um, by Jeff Loeb. And Jeff Loeb, by sheer coincidence, was my screenwriting teacher at USC. And he was the person who told me when I was in film school, I mean, I, I made movies since when I was a kid and I always wanted to go to film school and had always written scripts as, as a means to sort of making a movie that I would direct. But I never thought necessarily that I would sort of become a writer per se. And he said to me, listen, I said, you know, I really, I, I want to be a, a director, a filmmaker. And he said, well, that's what being a writer is. And you have to be a writer. You've got to keep doing that. And he was the one that, that told me that I should be a writer and who told me I could be a writer. And he was a total inspiration to me. And when I was doing the deep dive and I saw these comics, I said, I was aware of them, but I just, I guess I wasn't aware that Jeff had written them. And it just suddenly struck me that he'd written these incredibly influential and iconic comics and that he was the person that had set me on this path that amazingly brought me to Batman eventually. Um, and so that, that, element of, of the story in the series that he did with Tim Sale, those incredible drawings, um, is where this idea of trying to take that little piece and sort of see if there was a way to re, sort of, uh, re, re sort of contextualize that, to take all these little details so that I knew that people 
this character is so important to people that I know that people who have taken the deep dive on all these comics the way I have, that these comics mean so much to them. And I wanted to not do any of the stories directly, but I felt like it should be evocative of the, of the comics. And so there were little aspects of so many of them that inspired me. And so it was like this kind of thing where, in a weird way, I kind of just gathered them all, all these inspirations, and then almost like a blender, just kind of all sort of stuck in my mind. And as I was looking for the connections in this mystery, um, this was one that really stuck with me, this idea that as a noir, he'd be judging her and assuming that she'd had some kind of like compromised sexual relationship with Falcone, that she was doing that to, so she could rip him off. And in fact, she was trying to rip him off, but because that was the father who had given him her nothing and who owed him something and who was never going to give her anything and who later, she's going to find out, was the person who took her mother from her. And so this was really her revenge tale. And that the two of them in so many ways are alike and then in fundamental ways are very different. And so they have this great kind of noir push-pull and... He looks at her as a femme fatale, but when the truth of what she is comes out, she has motives that are as pure, if not more pure, when it comes to what's driving her with Falcone um, than, than he does. So that I thought was a, a fun thing, and it totally comes from the comics. And again, this is some of this detail also taken from the comics. Uh, Earth One talks about uh, the Martha coming from the Arkham family and the idea of mental illness and the idea of this uh, murder that happened in the past and that all of that would bring into question this notion of the mental health of Bruce and that as he's hearing this about his mother who obviously suffered because of the things that happened in her family and how she struggled and was institutionalized at various times, that that could potentially bring into question this obsessive mission that Bruce is on. So you start to question, and Bruce starts to question on some level, uh, the, nation, the notion of his, uh, his mental health. I hope you listen, Bruce Wayne. This is your legacy, too. And then this idea that somehow his father could be any less than the perfect image that he had sort of created in his head. He, his father was a heroic figure to him as a 10-year-old. He lost him at this moment of seeming perfection. You know, he was the man running for mayor, the man trying to create a, a fund to help the underprivileged in the city, the man trying to do all the right things, part of this lineage. And then um, they were robbed from him uh, at that age. And then the idea that somehow this could come back in this moment to a redefinition of his father as being less than perfect um, is a completely shattering idea. And to me, I thought it was an opportunity to lead into um, this notion of the mystery of who killed. There's obviously, the, there's the Joe Chill version uh, from the comics, but there's also this version, which I love, that they'll never quite know who killed his parents and that that mystery will haunt him forever and that nothing will bring us to the bottom of it. And I thought that this was an opportunity to present some potential possibilities and that his father's own corruption may have been one of the factors that led to their murders and that that was something that had never occurred to, uh, to Bruce. I love all that dialogue at the beginning where he's talking about, uh, he's talking to Bristow about the uh, expensive sweater and uh, the guy who invented uh, the ball. <laughs> what a brilliant concept, how much money you'd make and the idea that uh, the reason that communism failed was austerity. That was all made up by, uh, by John, who is one of the most inventive actors and he just had so many great ideas. He also, right when he met um, the, uh, uh, Bruce at the funeral, and he says, I remember your face looking down. That stuff was drawn from his deep dive on the comics, and he was like, I have a couple lines here. Would you mind if I throw them in? And I loved them when he said, I remember you, you know, 
uh, operated right there on the on the dining room table. I remember your face looking down, and uh, that was just that's just a I don't know for me, John Turturro is just one of the great actors, and to me, it was a dream of mine that he would play this character. I thought, it's funny, because when Cindy Tolan said to me, well, who, who do you imagine? I said, well, you know, it'd be like a John Turturro type. And she said, well, why not John Turturro? And I was like, it just hadn't occurred to me, because John Turturro to me was so untouchable. I love John Turturro. And she was like, let's ask him. And he, he, he read the script, and he said, well, I, I, you know what? I love Batman. Let's talk. And I had this series of conversations with him, and he ended up doing the movie, and then... We had such a great experience. He's just such a such an inventive. He had always had an idea for something and was always trying things. It was his idea. He also thought that uh, Selena later in the movie, uh, when he's strangling Selena, that she should scratch his face right in the place where he's got the Falcone scratches that are um, pictured from the uh, the Tim Sale series, you know, with Jeff Loeb that you see. Well, you see the Falcone tr try scratches and. The idea being that those scratches, if they come from Selena in this situation, they might have come from the original scratches, might have come from Selena's mother, which I just thought was brilliant. I loved it. I said, okay, we're doing that. <laughs> um, and that's what it was like working with him. He was just an utter delight. And that was a key part of this arc, was that somehow this childlike image of perfection, which no one can live up to, um, is shattered in this moment. And, and he is, as Falcone says, truly not a kid anymore. And it's about time. And this set is kind of inspired by... Uh, the Hearst Castle, the Casa del Sol. Uh, I was talking to James about it. We wanted him to be, I think that um, this notion that um, Bruce is almost like a Citizen Kane-like character. Um, and there was a scene actually where he tears the place apart in a way that is like he, teared, he tore the bedroom apart after Susan Alexander leaves him. Um, but that, idea of that bedroom, his parents being untouched and locked since he was a kid. When I went to the Casa del Sol, they had that beautiful screen work um, that you see in there. And I said, I said, James, do you think we could borrow? Because he had done the, the, I mean, all of that stuff that James built, that's what's left of his family, right? That's what's left of, of Wayne's family. And he built the most extraordinary set, that uh, gothic set. And, um, and the, the covers on the windows are right out of Hearst Castle, and the idea being that he's got this all, this castle built around him, but he's this kind of, you know, sort of lonely vampire figure, sort of stuck uh, in time. Why didn't you tell me? And this is the key here for really what drove. Bruce to become Batman, which is, in my mind, he became Batman because he couldn't bear to be vulnerable anymore. He couldn't bear the idea of ever going through that kind of pain again. It's the same reason why he won't let anyone get close to him, including Alfred, who really has been, as best as he could, been like his imperfect father and, ha and ha has, has loved him, but only been able to show it in the ways that he can, but he's, he's sort of desperately fumbling the way that, you know, that everyone does, um, that all fathers do, but he did as he was never prepared to be a father. He suddenly had to care for this 10-year-old kid. And in this idea that somehow he could reverse what happened to him by living out this idea of of taking vengeance on the criminal element, that every criminal he fights is in some way a reflection of the people who must have killed his parents. This idea that's very naive in a way, that he, he hasn't yet found the way 
to take that and move beyond it so that it's not purely personal. It's purely personal. And this idea is all about not really knowing any other way to cope. And, um, and this is the moment where he realizes even, I think, why he's kept Alfred at such arm's length. And, and why, honestly, you know, in the end of the movie, when he kind of loses it after he sees uh, Selena being attacked, you realize how he's driven by that. It shows the depth of his, his feeling for her, um, that he loses it to that degree, because it's unbearable for him. And he's never really going to be able to cope with that, which is why he's perfectly suited to being Batman, which is that he can't let people get that close to him, and he's driven to continue to do this. And so in that sense, his scars make him the perfect person to give over his life to this mission. And it starts as a personal mission, but he has to come to understand by the end of the story that it has to be more than that, that it can't just be a mission of vengeance for himself, that he has to represent more for the city. And this is the beginning of that right here as he realizes uh, that that feeling is really the thing that scared him the most. He thought he'd mastered himself. Uh, and that being Batman somehow could keep him from ever having to feel that way again, but it can't, because, of course, <laughs> we can't escape the truth of our emotions, and, in fact, in many ways, he's, he'll, never have, he'll never be able to leave those, those emotions. And so he's a very uh, imperfect but beautifully human hero. I mean, it shows just how much pain he has and how much he has an aversion to it, that he, he really has much less fear of dying than he does in going through the sense of loss of somebody that he cares about. That's the part. He, he, he can't be vulnerable in that way. And so Bruce and Alfred, in a way, finally reach that place in this moment. It starts with, you're not my father, and this is essentially, I love you. And they're, in a way, made imperfectly whole. Uh, and the idea is that their relationship can move on from here, and that's the last you see of them in this story. And hopefully there'll be more, and, and I think they're, you know, that you know, I had at one point even wanted you to see that fighting, and there, again, there's so many ideas you have and you can't get them all in, but in my mind, um, some of that physical training actually occurs with, um, with Alfred so that, you know, the way some fathers and sons, they connect through uh, sports and physical activities, things they can do together, or even the idea of watching movies together, that, that it's, a, it's an indirect way of showing love. And uh, I had always wanted to see um, Bruce coming home after a night of being the drifter and being Batman, and then his workout being sparring with Alfred, and that uh, Alfred would be uh, his sparring partner. And um, if we uh, if we do more, that's one thing I'd love to see Rob and Andy do. This is one of the few scenes um, we shot handheld, actually. And it's funny, because Greg, as a director of photography, he's done incredible handheld work in, in a lot of it, or, or even if he's using another operator. He just, but he's also a fantastic operator. Um, and I, I wanted this film, and actually, even both of the films we did together, and the Apes films were like this for me, too. I, the precision of a kind of almost kind of Hitchcockian approach where everything is very um, point of view driven and very precise. Um, there's a methodical way that I wanted the camera to act in this movie and it's very, very precise. You know, he's the world's greatest detective and he's piecing it together bit by bit and these pieces have to fit together in a very meticulous way and it's very dense. And I wanted this scene though to feel a bit unmoored 
So I came in one day and I said, okay, so Greg, you're not going <laughs> to, I don't, you're not going to believe that I'm asking for this, but what do we think if we did this one handheld? And he, he looked at me like, oh, fun, here we go. And uh, so we did this scene because it felt a bit more ungrounded. This is the scene where he comes to realize the truth of what happened to Annika and that that truth, the strangling, means that that's what must have happened to Selena's mother now that Selena has shared that story with him. And now we realize that Falcone is the core to all of it and we have to come fit all the pieces together. And so everything's a bit kind of floating in the air at the moment. There's a kind of grittiness. This is a little French connection-y. And for me, this scene not only becomes the moment where we understand that it was Falcone and that he is the dark Noah Cross-like figure who has been in control of this city, that he's the mayor for the last 20 years, he's controlling everything, and that he's the one who killed Selena's mother. Um, but it's also the place where the limits of the relationship between Selena and Batman Bruce are felt which is that she's called him here because she believes that he's vengeance, and this is the image he's projected into the city. And then you realize they don't see eye to eye here, and this pits them against each other for the first time uh, since that first moment when he encountered her in the uh, mayor's mansion when she was trying to steal Annika's passport back. And where's that going to go? So you start to realize that their relationship uh, is fraught, that while they seem to have come to an understanding, uh, they, they're distinctly different and on different sides of things. And where he might draw a line and come right up to it, she's squarely fine with being on the other side of it. And that says something a lot about where their relationship uh, could go from here and how, in that way, there's a sort of doomed quality to it. Kind of uh, sort of classic femme fatale, uh, tragic love story sort of side of it. I was always amazed at, uh, <laughs> this is Zoe doing all this with guns. Somebody, I, I think actually Dylan Clark said to me, oh, it, you really shouldn't speed this scene up this much. I was like, it's not sped up. Zoe <laughs> has total mastery of that gun like that. It was uh, unsettling. But her desire for vengeance and her wanting to do that exactly right was, uh, she was super committed. And this is one of these things coming up, too, where, you know, we had like a kerchief. There was a thing where you couldn't see the, the, um, the drifter's face, but Rob was like, I want to do one where you can just see my face. And I was like, I love that idea that he's walking in the club. And that was the one that we used because this idea that as Bruce Wayne, he's kind of covering himself. He's this drifter. Um, but it felt like in that mode, you could see that little bit of the drifter meets what's left of Batman under there with all that makeup on his eyes and he doesn't even have the kerchief around his face and he's just got that hoodie on and um, there was something satisfying to me about that collision of finally seeing how all of those modes which all those versions of him intersect Bruce drifter Batman all in one moment and this thing was one of the things that was very important to Zoe which was 
she said to me, look, since you're not doing Catwoman, and we're not going to be doing the thing where I debut a cat suit, because we have a kind of motorcycle suit that's as close as we ever come, she said, I think we should build to the year one outfit, the, the Mazzuccelli, Frank Miller year one outfit, which is that, this kind of like, um, sort of uh, laced bustier and the, the kind of tight leather pants and the short hair. And so in this scene, she's actually dressed to land that, but she doesn't yet have that wig off. So you're seeing her almost in year one mode. And then in the middle of that fight, she finally emerges in full year one form. And so that was designed as a as an homage and a kind of um, Easter egg for, for fans of the comics and in particular year one. So here the wig is about to come off. And from that point forward, she's year one Selena. Those, these two shots, probably the best initial look at it. Like, oh, there she is, right out of the movie. I mean, right out of the comics. And then this moment here, um, I did something in Apes where I had Rocket attack a guy in a cave. And I wanted to draw that to a much further um, sort of drawn out thing where the muzzle flashes in that scene of the soldier illuminated him. And I thought, okay, so we could probably use a CG version of Batman in this shot. And actually my Rob Alonzo said, no, 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 actually, I think we could do it all if you want to. And so we did. And these, this whole scene is lit only by the muzzle flashes. So the muzzle flashes are going off and, and you just hear Batman coming inexorably towards you. Um, and the only visual effects that are being done really are the visual effects of the bullets once they're being fired. Not the muzzle flashes, but the, um, the bullets ripping through uh, the hall and ripping off of Batman's armor. And um, there was something about that that I, I was very excited about doing, and I, we really were able to pull it off. I think it turned out really, really fun. And this next scene is the scene that I wrote for John to get him to do the film because he said to me, he said, you know, I, I, I'm very interested, but I, I want to know if you're open to my ideas. And he wanted, he just thought it was important at the end of all this because Falcone might have been the one who killed Bruce's parents. And obviously Bruce is wanting to know that. And so he wanted Falcone to say, oh, you think you're going to scare me with the mask and the cape that I'm going to cry and all his secrets going to come out? You know, he wanted to make sure that whatever he knew, he's got it. And if Batman wants it, he's never going to hear it because it's going to go with him to his grave. And of course, at that point, he has no idea he'll be going to his grave in the next couple minutes because he gets murdered very shortly. Um, but it was a way of kind of sort of haunting 
Batman Bruce one last time about trying to get that information. Did he kill not only Selina's mother, but also his parents? And we'll never have that answer. Alfred doesn't know. And Falcone knows. He knows if he did it. But in a moment, uh, that answer will probably be irretrievable because when Falcone's dead, the secret will probably die with him. Attorney. And so I had to, uh, I had a funny experience of, in doing that, I had to then call up John. I was like, well, what do I do now? I guess I'll read you. And he had told me how much he loved Zorro. And I said, oh, I want to put in this line about Zorro because I know that before he loved Batman, he loved Zorro. And I was like, I want to put this in. I just wanted him to do the film so badly. And I just thought, I just love talking to him. And um, so I wrote these scenes and I, I had to read them to him. And I, I was in the very weird position of having to read the John, like what I thought was the John Turturro voice to John Turturro. And at the end of it, he was like, yeah, I like it. Sounds good. Okay. And then we did it. And then... <laughs> From there forward, it was just uh, a joy. I got the joy of getting to work with uh, John, who, as I said, was amazing. I mean, this is one of the things, too, I think, you know, I've talked elsewhere about, but, like, Rob is such an incredible actor, and he's so technical, and he had to find the way to project what he was thinking with half of his face covered and with so much of his eyes covered. He's wearing black makeup. He, yes, he's looking through the cowl. If he turned the wrong way, you couldn't see his eyes. And it was an incredibly challenging role because to convey through the cowl so much detail that wasn't just about rage, which of course he had to convey, um, but was also about trying to piece together clues and being confused and, um, and seeing him broken up emotionally and all of these different things that had a level of subtlety that with half your face it's hard to convey Rob found a way to do he's just uh, he's just an incredible actor And in the scene that's about to come up where we arrest the Riddler, that's a perfect example of something that I used the VR for. And actually in the scene that you just saw where we did all of that stuff outside of the Iceberg Lounge and the shooting of Falcone, that there was, you know, you only have so much time and you have, we, have, we had COVID uh, to deal with and so we had to, you know, move in a certain pace and the only way to do that is to have a lot of these shots already sort of found. And... You know, Greg is amazing because he is able to, like, I'm very tunnel vision, so I will go on a search and I'll come with a plan and then the day of, I'm open to making changes if the, of a thing presents itself because that's what the director has to do. But um, what he's so wonderful about is he can be working on this but also working on the side on other things so he can be doing some R&D. So, for example, I had set this shot right there with the cops coming toward the window in VR and it was based on the fact that I wanted that to look like Nighthawks. I wanted it to look like the Edward Hopper painting. And it was written into the script that way. And then um, uh, James built it that way for that angle. And then I looked at it and I and, and, and had one of the camera down on a certain lens, which I knew was one of our lenses, and did that push in. And then Greg sent a breakaway crew while we were shooting other scenes to go and do the R&D in that shot to make sure that we could do it. And it was similar with the shot that's coming up on the coffee cup. Like, I was like, oh, I want to do this shot that pushes up on the coffee cup to reveal what he's doing. And Greg was like, oh, that is, uh, <laughs> that is not an easy shot to get. And he sent actually our best guys off to do it. And they couldn't do it. And he said, you know, the only way to do that shot is we have to, we have to actually get in a, a special piece of equipment it was like a techno dolly. I don't know if it was the techno dolly, but it was a it was like a it was like a kind of camera you would use on a commercial shoot where you can program in the move very specifically and you keyframe in the the uh, 
the, the different frames. And he r and d that to death until finally we had it and then we could shoot it one day. So all that's going on the side, Greg is making sure we can do all of these impossible things. But this, this scene started in the script, written shot for shot as what you're seeing. And then we did it in VR and I laid all those shots. And then we had the crew break off and, and do the R&D on those shots. And then Greg brilliantly lit them and then here they were. And it's one of those things where, and then on top of that, you have Paul Dano who I think in that scene that along with that music, which sounds like something out of uh, uh, Clute to me with the kind of voices going, la, 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 and then that smile on Paul's face. To me, that scene is just, uh, it's Paul's smile that really elevates it to this other level that I just feel um, really tickles me. Because you've been waiting all this time to see him, and then you're like, is that him? And then... He smiles, and, and he smiles at Batman, and you're like, why is he smiling? And we're going to find out later. It's because he's so happy to see him. But it could be because he's toying with him the way that a, a cat might toy with a, with a mouse. And the line that, uh, that Riddler has in that scene was inspired by... I read about the Golden State Killer and how they had been looking for him for so long. And when they, f he is a former policeman actually, and when they showed up to arrest him, he knew and he was outside. And I believe what he said was, because uh, he knew they were there to take him in, he just said, I just put a roast in the oven. Meaning, if you're going to take me in, you should at least let me take the roast and turn it off. And I just thought that that apple pie, like as if somehow maybe he, he was gonna, they would wait while he finishes the apple pie before they take him in. I just thought that was very unsettling, that idea of that kind of understated thing. And then I love the way Paul did it. And then this whole idea of the Riddler's origins through these ledgers um, playing out right here, that Gordon is reading how the Riddler was created right here in this moment. He knows what he must become. He must become the Riddler. And uh, all of that comes from uh, the way in which he retreated in his mind um, from his trauma into puzzles and um, into patterns and numbers and became a forensic accountant and a brilliant one because of it. And then by sheer luck happened to come across the path one day of seeing that word renewal on one of the ledgers and in his uh, unauthorized forensic accounting discovered that that didn't all add up and he was asked to stay away from that plan because obviously uh, that was a corrupt project that he was to know nothing about but he couldn't resist because he knew from that word that he'd heard as a child that somehow he'd been betrayed and this was the answer to the whole thing and through that he takes this path that leads him to become the Riddler and it's how he finds out about the funds. I was reading about Manafort and how uh, the shell companies work and, um, and I started thinking about how this charitable fund could be used uh, as a kind of shell company for bribes and, um, and that all of that might describe a history of corruption and how Falcone could have had a stranglehold on the, uh, on the city that, ne that was not broken to this day and then finally in this moment now it is. And this is the key to the whole thing, which is to think that this isn't over yet and the way that it's meant to end is that the next victim must be to kill the Batman. And the way to kill the Batman is to destroy his anonymity. And so Batman is now looking and saying, I know the real you, which of course we realize later means that he knows his essence. He knows the power of being masked. He was inspired by Batman. He understands all of that. But when he sees all of this, he realizes that the last target, first he tried to kill Bruce Wayne, and if he wasn't going to kill Bruce Wayne, he could destroy Batman by exposing who he is. Because if the world knows that Batman is Bruce Wayne, then he loses his power to come out of the shadows and to have an effect on the criminal element. They'll just know, oh, it's Bruce Wayne showing up in that outfit. And so some of that power comes from people not knowing who he is. And this now 
feels like it's the reckoning. I love Michael's music here too. It is very unsettling and he did a very interesting thing that plays out in this next scene, which is that there's a tug of war between two themes. He's got Riddler's theme that's playing kind of in this mode and it starts that way as Riddler is in control. And as the tables start to turn and Batman starts to respond, the Batman theme comes in and it starts to play. And then when Batman realizes he's missed something and he didn't solve it, the music switches back around and it becomes the Riddler's theme again. And I just thought that was brilliant. This scene for me too is, it's one of my favorite scenes in the movie. And I just think the way that Paul and Rob play off of each other is so wonderful. And as an audience, everything's built to this moment for us to believe, okay, how are we gonna get out of this? He knows who Bruce, who Bruce Wayne is. Is that what this is? And, and in this scene, it does feel like he's the cat toying with the mouse before he kills him. And um, you're thinking, well, how do we get out of this? And then you realize it wasn't what you thought at all. And um, that's the turn of the whole movie. There originally was a scene earlier in the film where when Batman, early in the story, was receiving these cor the correspondence from the Riddler and was so unsettled. Why is this guy writing to me? And he, he goes to Arkham to, um, to talk to another serial killer whose face we don't quite see. He's out of focus. He's called the Unseen Prisoner. Um, but in that scene... That character who uh, is, in fact, I, I'm pretty sure we'll do the deleted scene for you here on this thing, but he is talking about the fact that Bruce is in a little bit of denial because the two of them really are very much the same. Uh, and that if anything, maybe Bruce is, or Batman is concerned because Riddler is more righteous. They're both masked vigilantes, um, only uh, the Riddler is less forgiving. He kills them. And wouldn't Batman like to kill them? And the point of the end of the scene is that, and, and the character is right when he says it, that um, the truth of all of it is that what's so unsettling to Batman is that one part of him thinks that these victims of the Riddler deserve what came to them. And it's, that's kind of echoed in that moment uh, when he's talking to Gordon and he's talking about the death of Commissioner Savage. And he says, hey, he was a cop, he crossed the line. And he says, you act like he had it coming. And uh, there's some part of Bruce that is so wedded to revenge and is so angry at the idea in this very unshakable way of corruption that he is aligned in an uncomfortable way with the Riddler. And so they really are spiritually connected. And that's one of the important through lines of the movie is the ways in which they're alike and the lines that separate them. That's the turn of the whole thing. It turns out, wait a minute, only when we didn't get, what is this about? And that's when you realize it's a love story. God. And that's what, that's really what Paul and I talked about was this. And he did, it's interesting, I did so many takes with him in this scene. He tried so many different things. I mean, like, I don't know, I would say probably 50 different takes at least. Um, and this was the series here. Uh, he, there was a level of, you know, sometimes he played it as if it was even more transparent how happy he was Batman was there. And I was worried that it would give away too much. And so um, we settled on this series where you get this sense that in a sinister way, he knows exactly who Bruce Wayne is. And then you realize uh, that's not true. I never could have gotten so the music here is is Batman's music. And this is the key moment at this point in the film for Batman in that he's resisting every inch of this. He doesn't want to take in any of this. This idea that he could have inspired 
these awful killings, the idea that somehow he was projecting something out into the world that would create the Riddler, the only way that's acceptable is that the Riddler is a sociopath and that he is completely demented and that he's come up with this really on his own. He's twisted it. But the question really is, well, yes, there's truth to that, but how much has he twisted it? How much of what he's done has affected the city? And at this point in the story, he refuses to let any of it in. And then everything takes an even darker turn when he realizes that the, the plan wasn't just for them to have this sort of, in the Riddler's mind, reunion or this connection, but it was actually for them to be together when the last part of the plan, the last part of the puzzle plays out. And it's the one thing that after the Riddler is robbed of this power of their connection, he finally gets his power back again, and now the music becomes the Riddler's again. Um, and he can finally comfort himself with the knowledge that he's smarter than Batman. And that's how he's been protecting himself his whole life. So Batman, Bruce, has been protecting himself by withdrawing into this invulnerable state of dealing out vengeance. And the Riddler has lorded this idea of his intelligence over everyone. And he thought that Batman was as smart as he was and as, as aligned and just more physically powerful. And then he realizes that in his way, he believes he's more powerful than Batman. And so now he taunts him with the singing of the Ave Maria. And now Batman is completely at rock bottom, befuddled, like, what did I miss? And this is one of those things, too, that on the day, the last day we were shooting some of the videos, I said, you know, I would love you to continue to taunt him. So we took this picture. I had, um, I had Paul take a picture of himself. I wanted to see him the way I saw him when he had that saran wrap around his head, but no mask yet. <laughs> and then the version of him with the mask and that he would put it up. He'd be looking at himself. And this is a character who, you know, Gil Perez Abraham, who plays uh, Martinez, I just, he's a character that I enjoy so much and I love Gil's performance. Um, especially this here. <laughs> he says, I don't think you should be touching that. He's doing everything he can to be a cop. He's like a rookie. And he feels like he's supposed to be drawing the lines the way a cop would. And then Batman keeps looking at him like, are you really going to hassle me, man? <laughs> but my favorite thing was this, this idea, even just this idea of the class of it too, that he comes from a family, his, his uncle was a carpet installer. And that the whole mystery might turn on the fact that this, this kind of working class rookie cop would have the answer to the entire mystery because he, he was the one who was able to see that that tool, the, the murder weapon, as Batman called it, that he killed Mitchell with and that he attacked Coulson with, it's not just a murder weapon, it's his confession. It's a tucker. It's a carpet tucker. And that tells Batman that that's meant to somehow connect to the untucking of this carpet. And that is what reveals the dark truth and enormity of, of Riddler's plan. And then I love how <laughs> Gil's like, oh God, everything he does with this guy, he's touching all the evidence. And then it's out for them both to see. And then the two of them are in the helpless position of, of watching what the Riddler has laid out. Something about this, I, I found very disturbing, this idea of the Riddler being part of this lonely community and um, communicating with them and all of them channeling their rage, their misdirected rage um, and their tortured and demented rage in this direction because of how uh, ostracized they felt and how unsettling that was and how darkly human. It was, and something about him saying, hey guys, seem very much of 
of the moment, of our time, of the way that uh, so many people communicate over uh, social media. And um, in a way spoke to a kind of uh, darkness in our society right now, our, our, our sickness. And I thought that the way that Paul did this was very unsettling. And it's interesting, originally I had wanted this through the voice decoder, which lowered his, or the voice encoder, which, which lowered his voice. Um, but then after I realized we had seen him and he was so, Paul's performance affects me so much when we see him in the diner and when we see him in Arkham, that I realized it would be great to just let his voice come through as his own now, because we already have him unmasked, and now just to see him in that mask talking to his followers would be very unsettling. And it was one of the challenges of the story narratively, which was, okay, so if the plan was that Batman is going to be drawn into being with Riddler in Arkham when this dark plan plays out, but then it doesn't go the way the Riddler's plan, and then Batman discovers what the true plan is. I needed a way for the Riddler to be present in this third act, because that is really who he's facing off with. He's facing off with the Riddler. And so this idea that his followers would adopt his persona and essentially become extensions of him, um, that was one of the ideas that we came up with to kind of crack that nut. And, um, you know, it was a, it was a real challenge. We kind of had boxed, our, boxed ourselves into a corner. Um, and I think that that aspect played out and, and seemed to be very chilling to think that these guys were all going to be coming to this place dressed as, he, as him to carry out his plans. And these, these sequences that are the shot up in the rafters, they're very challenging because I wanted the whole movie to appear as if it was practical. And I wanted to shoot as much as we could in real places or on sets that felt incredibly real, which James Chinlin's sets were. But this was the one area, and I know that Greg and I were both very worried about it because it was one of the only areas that was in a traditional blue screen enclosure. Basically, all that was there were the, um, the catwalks, the railings, and then blue screen. And so we worked with Dan Lemon, who did the Apes movies with me. I think he's just the best VFX supervisor in the world. I think he's incredible. Um, I said, this section has to feel as connected visually to the rest of the movie as possible. And we had used these very imperfect anamorphic lenses. I mean, Greg's lenses were... Um, you know, we, we were very careful about keeping the focus in the center of the frame because the edges would go so soft and, and all of it was about trying to take the perfection of sort of digital photography and bring in that kind of filmic quality that you might see in that 70s um, sort of police thriller uh, in an anamorphic film and using the qualities of those lenses, which for me also add a kind of psychological quality, an emotional quality, the idea of their focus fall off and the bokehs. And so in these areas, we pushed Scanline, who did the VFX in this sequence, to take all of those imperfections and take them and put them into the extensions. So when you're seeing all of the shots that are up top, they are based, first of all, on photography that we did at the O2 Arena, where we had Greg take reference and, and get the cameras up there in real light so that Scanline would have reference. And then they took the lenses from the rest of the movie and introduced huge layers of imperfection so that you wouldn't be looking at a section of the film that would suddenly feel like that kind of antiseptic CG thing that you can sometimes see where you just don't feel like it's real, you just know it's kind of a fantasy. I didn't want any of this stuff to feel like a fantasy. I wanted it all to feel like the rest of the movie or the movie would feel like it had suddenly entered a different mode. And so what you're seeing in all of these shots up above, down below, that's the O2 arena, and up above is all on a very small sound stage with a blue screen enclosure and, uh, and some catwalks. It was a 
It was a very small set, actually. All of this stuff. And I wanted this section for Batman to come in again in a horror film mode. Like, it was important, I talked to Michael about this music having a kind of anger to it, because this wasn't about someone coming in to save the day, given how dark these circumstances were. It was about him coming in like a, like a horror figure again, coming in to unleash, and so that you could see him uh, desperate, because really, this is the crucible that he has to sort of be forged in, because this is a situation of his own making. Batman doesn't realize that he inspired the Riddler elsewhere, and now he suddenly realizes these people are all hit here because of him to some degree, and certainly because he wasn't smart enough to put the clues together. And so, because he missed the clue, his penance is to come here and to, to, to do anything he can to stop these people from unleashing the Riddler's plan. And so you see him fight. And one of the things I talked about with Rob Alonzo was I didn't want to enter into another mode where suddenly Batman starts doing things with contraptions and things that we hadn't seen. I wanted this to be essentially in the same mode that we had seen throughout the movie, which was a fight scene. And another one of our long playing, like I wanted the fight scenes as much as possible to play out in continuous shots, to not break them out into, into quick cuts as much as possible so you could see the fight happening and the choreography. And I wanted these to be no, no different. The only reminder that I wanted of how this was different was the camera to be lifting repeatedly to let you know that that fight that you were seeing, which was in some ways not so different from the fight that you saw at the uh, train platform in the beginning of the film, that it was at great height. So that the big spectacle of our kind of grounded Batman was another one of those very grounded fight scenes in which he uh, was doing it at a tremendous height um, and without a net. And so that was what we worked on and how uh, we laid the shots in VR to try and tell that story. And then again, like a horror figure, he pounces. And we had actually done a lot of this in mocap in Los Angeles with stunt guys laying all of this out months before we ever went to London. And then that continued to evolve. Um, until finally the sequence was played out uh, and we shot it in the, in the small rafter set. And this moment, you know, it was important to me because I wanted an empowered Catwoman. And the idea that he had saved her from throwing her life away by killing Falcone and that she would come in here and save him um, in this moment, that seemed like an important thing, that she was uh, the agent of his uh, sort of rescue. And that here he was at his most physically vulnerable. And then, of course, in a moment, the tables will be turned on her again as she, she thinks she's gotten this guy, but he reemerges. But Batman's still in that weakened state, and that's when you see just how deep his feelings for Selina are. He tells Alfred how distraught he is in the hospital at this idea of ever losing someone he cares about again. And we know he's talking about Alfred, but when he responds the way he does, in this scene, we realize that these are the feelings that he's developed for Selena. And you realize also just how close he always is to crossing his own line. You know, he, he wants to believe that he wouldn't kill. And yet at the same time, he comes so close so many times throughout the scene. He's, he's in so, so many ways so recklessly close to the edge. And some of it is even luck how close he is to committing murder, really. And here, I think, if Gordon didn't come and stop him, he would have killed this guy, absolutely. That's how out of control he is. And Gordon kind of brings him to his senses. And in fact, um, he's in a state right now where he is just in pure instinct. This is like the comic ego. You know, the beast in him is unleashed. Darwin Cook uh, has this great comic ego. And here he turns, he's ready to turn on Gordon. He's gonna hit Gordon. And then he finally sees it as Gordon and comes back. Um, and so this idea of 
him not being in total control of himself as Batman and how, how close he is to being out of control so much of the time, that's one of the things we really wanted to explore and I loved exploring with Rob. And in this moment, this is the look where Selena gives him the look where she realizes just how much uh, he's just been exposed in terms of how much depth of feeling he has for her. And then this next moment is, to me, the key of the entire arc. And this was one of the early conceptions when I was coming up with the story. I wanted this idea of him putting the message of vengeance out into the city to have an effect. And Batman's been resisting it, but in this moment we realize it's true. And when he hears that, that is the moment where he realizes that it's one thing to have missed the clue, but now he realizes in some certain way he's very implicated in this and everything that's happened in the city, everything that's happened here is in large part connected to the message he put out about being vengeance and that he has to change and do more. And then when this playing out of the seawall comes here, you hear the kind of clarion call, the bell, the action, which is really the first time in the movie where Batman moves to a self-sacrificial gesture that isn't about um, hurling himself in violence at someone. Uh, Bruce does it. Bruce does it. He saves, um, he saves Mitchell's son uh, instinct, you know, in an instinctive way at the funeral. But here, it's like a call to action. Batman has to be more. And Batman can't just be um, someone who is playing out the satisfaction of, of his vengeance in the name of uh, the people in the city who are asking for it, who need it, who need a defender. He actually needs to be more than that. And, and in this moment, he's willing, in fact, if this kills him, to sacrifice himself. And this water moment is sort of like a baptism, you know, <laughs> to get kind of highfalutin about it. But that was sort of what the hope and what the feeling was. Um, and he reemerges here. And he's a different Batman, really. Um, it doesn't mean that those other parts aren't somewhere still in him and that he won't have to fight those parts within him. But he has to step out. In a way, he has to become a beacon. And this moment with the flare is really that. And um, I have to say that um, this moment, in particular, Michael's music for this moment, is such a beautifully emotional piece of music and I think conveys the emotion of what this scene represents so powerfully to me. And when he first um, had the orchestra play it, I was in tears. And um, I remember when uh, we watched the final playback of the movie, um, when it got, I cried in the scene, yes, but at the end, this music is reprised. And uh, when it was, at the end of it, it's, it had been a five-year journey of making this movie for me. And we had all been through so much. The whole world had been through so much. And um, when I heard his music again there at the end of the movie, and I saw actually Andrew Jack's name, who is our dialect coach who died of COVID during the shooting of this film, the whole experience came crashing in on me and I broke down there at the studio and I had to leave the stage, I was just sobbing. And it was because I really felt that Michael's music had captured the emotion of what we'd all been through. And um, I just think this is an incredible piece of music. And there's something to me that's powerful and moving about that image, about him for the first time really like a Pied Piper leading these people, uh, in this case, out of danger. Some of these images are even, you know, inspired. You know, when I was, as I said, I write, um, I write to music. I listen to uh, Michael's music. I listen to Nirvana, um, and uh, I also I look at images. I, I read the comics in this. I read books. I, I just, I, I sort of thought of personal events. You know, my family's from the East Coast. The, the, my, there's bits of my father <laughs> that are in this movie in my head and how I connect to it. I always have to find a personal way in. Um, and one of the things I do is I, I also exchanged images, as I said, with them um, when I was giving pages to uh, 
James Chinlin, but uh, also with Greg Frazier. He sent me these images of um, city underwater, and uh, that just worked its way into my brain. And I wanted to put that into the movie, and so there they are. That's the, that actually came inspired by images he sent me. And that particular scene right there where Jimmy Lawson talks about having um, the city having lost faith in its leaders and its institutions and how we had to rebuild when we were shooting that um, we were all very affected because weirdly the movie was written so long ago and our world in many ways seemed to have kind of come up and moved into sync with Gotham in a way that we never expected and uh, we were all very uh, unsettled by her speech and moved by her speech she delivered it so beautifully and I, I feel very much about Rob's performance the same way right here as he's he's talking about how angry the city is, how scarred it is. And um, this is the this is the idea of the whole sort of journey of his character and, and the one that was important to me, which was um, but if we survive that, to see that he could uh, he could move from being vengeance to being hope. They can give us the power, or at least try. You know, it's the human struggle. And in this next scene, you know, a lot of people ask me, they think, oh, is this a setup, you know, for another movie? And to be honest, it, it really, it really isn't. It really wasn't. For me, what this was, like I said, there was a scene with this character right here, the unseen prisoner, earlier in the film who was profiling. And um, Mike Marino did this amazing makeup for it. Um, and this for me was tracking because Paul and the Riddler, um, was in the action of the third act in a very particular way. And the last we'd seen him, he was saying boom in his window as the bombs went off. And we hadn't yet seen him take in the fact that it hadn't, that Batman had been able to pull things back from the brink and that his plan had not played out. I really wanted to see the end of, of that arc for Riddler. And so we, we had this scene, and we actually took it out at a certain point because we thought, well, maybe we don't need it because we've taken out the earlier scene. And the interesting thing was that by not having this scene, not only did you not get to see what I think is a fantastic performance from both actors, from, from Barry um, and from Paul here, um, and when Paul starts laughing after Barry does it, I find it so delightful. Um, and it was a great texture change and a tonal change from what is a kind of, you know, sort of painful ending to the movie but also it changed the stakes of the final scene. When she said, when, when Selena says to him, you know that this place is never gonna change, and he's like, I gotta try, and she's, it's not. This idea that trouble is already brewing again, that in this moment of the power vacuum, that people are already scheming. When you took this scene out, it didn't have that sort of same resonance, and the idea that he could go away with her seemed more reasonable, and you thought, well, gee, why is he staying? And so that, that was critical, actually, to the ending of the movie and um, to the finishing of the Riddler's arc as well. So um, uh, what we'll do with these characters in the future remains to be seen, but it was never meant to be uh, like an Easter egg scene to say, like, oh, guess what we're using in the next movie. It was meant to be something delicious uh, for the audience to sort of experience um, those two characters meeting. And, and in fact, for the unseen prisoner to say to him, riddle me this, which is, of course, right out of... Uh, Batman 66. This scene was also shot, this is another scene that was shot on uh, the LED volume, and so all of the city around them and sky, we went to Glasgow, actually, and uh, the sequence that follows when they're going through the cemetery, that's all filmed in Glasgow, and this is filmed on the stage, but the whole skyline is built from both the vista of Glasgow, but also our vista. So that bridge over there is our bridge, and um, and all of it was was built. James built it with his team, um, and along with ILM, and then um, Greg uh, so masterfully put it on the uh, used it to light the scene. And um, I think it's absolutely stunning. And I love the way the light plays on them in this way that I think is so beautiful. And and then more than anything, I, I love their performances in this last scene. I think this is the sort of core of everything, that, that a movie that starts the way it does ends up ultimately being uh, 
a sort of unrequited love story, these two people who want to be together, but they're not going to be. And of course, that, that sort of leads into the deliciousness of when they'll meet again and um, how the next time they meet, they might be even further on opposite sides. But here's this brief moment in uh, the days before she's Catwoman where the two of them might be together. And I, I, I love that moment where Rob goes in to kiss Zoe and then she backs off. And then she said, I think you should go. And uh, you think he has one last chance right here to ask her to stay. And uh, he doesn't. Because he's really, he can't let himself get that close. And um, the truth is, if he could, could she let herself get that close to him? And so the two of them are broken in the way that makes them perfectly suited to be the characters and the hero and anti-hero that they are. Um, but it, it makes for a very poignant sort of push-pull relationship that they have. And I think it's kind of emblematic of this movie that the most sort of romantic, sad goodbye would also be them riding their motorcycles, uh, kind of chasing each other one last time through a cemetery. Um, and it was a very special experience to get to make this movie, you know? I mean, it's a, it's a daunting experience to make a Batman movie. You know, the history is so great, and there have been so many great ones, and to try and do something that we could all put ourselves into and feel like we had something fresh to say and to do, I think it's a true testament to the character um, and to all of the characters in this world and how enduring they are, that they are that open to reinterpretation and that they last um, in the hearts and minds of the audience the way they do after so much time. You know, what I noticed when I was writing this story um, was just how many people, uh, as I would go out each day to go grab lunch or be out on the weekends with my family, I'd see people in their, their Batman baseball caps or Batman sweatshirts and and you just realize, you know, you, you see, you'd see babies in Batman onesies and you realize just how important this character is to people. And for just a little bit of time, you know, I was allowed to be custodian along with all of the actors and all of the incredible people, the, the crew that worked on this film. We got to carry him for a little while and um, I hope there'll be more. Um, all that remains to be seen, but it was a, an honor and a privilege.